every central bank is competing with every other to bring inflation down quickly. There, there's a lot of confusion. Investors are not sure how this is going to play out. We're finding real opportunities. There has been carnage in this market. It's all about the rate of change, and I think that's what really central banks would react to. The government's really taking a gamble here that the policies that it's implementing are going to do something to boost growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A messy end to a messy week. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. My partners in crime, Tom Keen and Jonathan Farrow, are off watching reruns of Ted Lasso together, which is great for us because we have Kaylee Lines and Damian Sassauer in the seat. It feels like something is breaking, a sea change, Kaylee, in markets. I love the way our colleague John Authors put it in his column in Bloomberg Opinion this morning. This was a week that shook the world. Each and every day, some kind of market fiasco seems to have happened in terms of pricing and assets. In foreign exchange, in bonds, of course, we've seen intervention to stem the weakness in the Japanese yen for the first time since 1998. We've seen the Fed saying we're going to go farther and stay higher for longer than the market previously anticipated. And after a 50 basis point hike from the BOE yesterday, this market now pricing in a 50 percent chance they go 100 next time around because of the fiscal policies we've had announced in the UK this morning, Lisa. And Damien, in your world, your world is driving so much of this. People People looking for something to break, particularly in the developing world as the dollar continues to strengthen. Are things starting to break? Well, I mean, if you're including Japan in my world, which I don't believe you are, well then, yeah, sure, things are breaking. I mean, look, you know, the money has to come from somewhere, right? You don't see the Bank of Japan hitting the Fed swap lines. Are they selling, uh, are they selling treasuries in order to fund their intervention policy? That remains to be seen, but if yesterday's price action is any indication, yeah, you know, I bet you had some central banks out there selling treasuries to raise assets to protect their currencies, Lisa. All right, when we talk about currencies, and Kaylee, I know you've been on top of this, we've been looking at which currency pairs are really breaking down, and today very much front and center the pound. It's been breaking down uh, for the past few weeks, but now we're down to 111. <laughs> uh, and this is just raising a lot of questions and comes as this administration of Liz Truss announces the biggest tax cuts going back to 1973. Does it feel controlled? I mean, what are you hearing this morning? I don't think it feels particularly controlled because this is also a case of monetary and fiscal policy running against each other in some sense because she's talking about tax cuts at the same time that they are attempting to boost spending to stem the energy crisis. They say that's going to cost about 60 billion pounds. They have to issue debt to do that. So what you're seeing is huge moves in gilts. We've uh, at one point on the day up 50 basis points on the day on the five year gilt yield and the pound as you allude to Lisa. We had a breach of 111 at one point the lows of the day 110.77. These are levels we haven't seen since 1985 and it is a sense of there's not much that policymakers can do to stem the losses in this currency unless you see something akin to the 80s in a plaza accord. So before we get to the price action, Damian, I know you've been in this market for decades, and I'd love your perspective on what the analogy is, what the conversations among the traders you speak to are like, what the level of concern, of fear, of a uh, potential opportunity and excitement there is. Well, I mean, for me, look, I, I mean, I've, I've long been on the record here as saying I think intervention's a bygone conclusion. There will need to be intervention at some point, whether it's unilateral or there's some sort of coordinated plaza type accord remains to be seen. I mean, I think the only thing, quite frankly, holding back sort of a coordinated intervention, so to speak, is the fact that a stronger dollar is bad for China. And so, you know, the U.S. has no intention, I think, of, you know, basically weakening, weakening it intentionally because of that fact. And so, look, Europe and England and the rest are really going to have to deal with that in the current environment. Right now we're looking at losses pretty much across the board. And I want to get a sense, and, and Kaylee, you know, jump in here with what you're seeing. But what I'm seeing is an S&P that is down nearly 12 percent, actually going toward 13 percent. Uh, so far, right now, you are seeing it continue the losses. That's just on the week I'm or of the past couple of weeks. Right now, down eight tenths of a percent. And you can see the Nasdaq down one percent. It just has been this grind in particularly the big tech stocks, some of the most uh, high flyers from earlier in the pandemic. It's valuation pressure in the face of higher rates and more importantly, higher real yields. That is the very reason why we had David Costin over at Goldman Sachs saying, hey, I'm cutting my S&P target down. Yeah. of that valuation question. And when you take a look at some of the yields, you're just seeing uh, yields stabilize here, but uh, just after coming off such incredible highs, I mean, I was just looking, for example, at two-year yields, and since mid-August, they have climbed about a percentage point, 4.18%. You can see 10-year yields also climbing uh, one full percentage point going back to mid-August. Right now, we're looking at 3.74%. Kaylee, what are we looking at today? 
Well, we're going to see whether or not we get any more substantial bond moves because we are going to get some economic data. It is not the most paid attention to, but we will be getting the preliminary read for September U.S. PMIs. What we're looking for is contraction territory still when it comes to that services and composite metric services. The expected read 45 and a half. And remember, 50 is what indicates expansion or contraction territory. The manufacturing still expected to be in uh, expansion territory, but a little bit lower at 51. So it really just speaks to the kind of softening we are seeing in certain areas of the economy as we are seeing policy tightening. And on the subject of policy tightening, we will hear from the tightener himself, Jerome Powell. He'll be speaking at 2 p.m. Eastern today at a Fed Listens event. I wonder if his message is just going to be do you guys get me now are we all on the same page because I said it at Jackson Hole and I said it again on Wednesday and finally it seems like the market is coming around to how aggressive the Fed is actually thinking at this point so it'll be interesting to see how much he just repeats some of the same language he has been using for some time now and if he reiterates that line it will be enough and finally looking ahead past this Friday into the weekend. Sunday going to be critical for Italy as they head to the polls. The Italian election going to be closely watched, not just in Italy, but across Europe, as it looks likely the front runner in this race is the right wing Gia uh, Georgia Maloney, of course, Brothers of Italy party. She says she is going to be in keeping with Mario Draghi's policy on the fiscal front. But given that she does have a history of being somewhat of a Eurosceptic, there is a lot of question as to what her actual policy will translate to if she does indeed win the election. Election, and that is going to be something very closely watched by these markets. We'll have coverage of that, of course, here on Bloomberg, Lisa. Yeah, regime change pretty much across the board. Kaylee, thank you so much. Regime change leading many people to wonder, are things starting to break? Steve Sosnick joining us now, chief strategist at Interactive Brokers. Are you starting to see things breaking? Um, good morning, Lisa. I, I wouldn't say breaking. Um, I, I, my point was going to be exactly the one that Kaylee just made, which is people are coming around to realize that the Fed is – stop looking for the Fed to be your friend. Stop looking for Powell to say something conciliatory. He's not. Um, and this is, I think, a, you know, a big splash of cold water in the face of the market. And, you know, we're back down sort of at the levels that were freaking people out um, in June. We've done a, basically a full round trip over the past two Fed meetings, up then down. And this was all because of pe the way market interpreted Fed's rhetoric. The big problem to me, though, is you know when you have market unable to price relatively safe assets like two-year securities. You know what's safer than two-year treasuries in theory, um, but if you can't figure out a way to price two-year treasuries, it, it makes it almost impossible to come up with a way to price other risk assets like stocks and and things that are even riskier. Well, Steve, let's talk stocks. I mean, and I hate to talk seasonals, but the world is cyclical and equities have historically performed rather well in the fourth quarter. I mean, and we, we're also going into a midterm year, right? So they performed pretty well on the 12 months following a midterm. I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts on the impact of seasonal factors as we head into the fourth quarter for U.S. equities? Well, you know what? My first, my, my first real job, like basically, you know, came out of the Solomon Brothers trading class just in time for the 1987 market crash. So I, I'm very much, um, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a person who keeps seasonals in mind. The seasonal that I'm keeping in mind, unfortunately, is the, the last time that the Fed raised rates and and had, you know, was trying to shrink its balance sheet. I don't even know if they called it QT at the time, Q, QT at the time was fourth quarter 18 and that was a seasonal problem be because you know the market sort of came to this nasty slamming of the brakes I, I i don't want to go quite so far as to say we're going to see that again but the the you know the, the 15 or so percent decline since we've seen you know in the last few weeks has that smell to it um and so yeah the, you know the, the problem with seasonals are they work until they don't but i do think there's a bit of psychology that goes on you know as people sort of realize oh it's the end of the year my my performance is good my performance stinks i got to you know i, I want to lock in whatever it is um, and i think that that mentality tends to pervade now as well well, aside from seasonals and psychology, if you look at actual fundamentals and, and the kind of multiple you can put on stocks, Goldman Sachs, their argument being basically it's about 15 is what's appropriate when you look at forward earnings, a uh, forward multiple, given the kind of rates pressure they expect to see, where they expect the Fed to go on the price side. On the earnings side, you also have the Fed trying to fight inflation, demand possibly deteriorating in this economy. That can hit corporates on the earnings side as well. What kind of valuation do you think we're going to end up with for the equity market as a whole? 
Um, well, that's, you know, we're, we're very much in flux now. I, I do tend to think that, that the lower valuation, I, when I saw the 15 comment, I was not, I was, you know, it's not really, uh, that's basically the number I've been sort of putting in my head. We've got an interesting problem. We, we may have, we don't know what earnings are going to do yet. We have, we're going to find out over the coming weeks. Um, they have to be slowing. The dollar has to be a huge headwind for the big multinationals um, that make up the major indices. Um, and also remember, most of your money that's made and lost in the stock market is through multiple expansion. And so that's really just, you know, that that's animal spirits to a certain extent, if nothing else. And, you know, to get back to Lisa's original point, the animal spirits feel crappy this morning um, and have all week. <laughs> <laughs> Stu Sosnick, the animal spirits feel crappy. That's the technical analysis. Interactive Brokers, thank you so much for being with us. It's true. Damien, right now, things feel kind of crappy and you see that just money going into cash. Yeah, no, I mean, the whole pyramid is collapsing now, as they say. No, no, no. I mean, look, you know, the whole thing for me is, is the Fed put really dead? You know, Lisa, I, 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 I'm, I'm not convinced there. I think the Fed blinks at some point here when things get pretty painful. Really? Yeah, I do. I okay, do. so what does it mean to get pretty painful? I mean, this is actually something well, that what, I've been reading notes about. That's what we want to ask our experts, Lisa. Oh, no, I'm okay. Kidding. No, for, for, <laughs> okay. Pretty painful means I, I imagine we're going to see it in the perils first and foremost. I got to believe that's going to be the print that's going to move the needle. Well, and I wonder, Kaylee, how much this just has to do with how quickly unemployment rises, which is a really uncomfortable thing, not only heading into midterms, but just in general. No one wants to see anyone lose their jobs. Right. And if that's what's going to cause the Fed to back away from the rate hiking, ugh, it's uncomfortable. It is. We thought the politics of inflation were difficult. The politics of hurting the economy and the jobs market by fighting inflation are also incredibly challenging. And that is what we're facing going into the midterms and what a Fed that is becoming increasingly politicized is dealing with as they set policy now. It's a soggy morning ahead of the open, about uh, two hours and 15 minutes to go here. Uh, actually, three hours and 15 minutes. I'm looking right now, the S&P down eight tenths of a percent, nine tenths of a percent, call it Euro 97 handle versus the dollar. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Liz Truss's government has come out with the most radical set of tax cuts since 1988. Both workers and companies will see their taxes reduced. Chancellor of the Exchequer Kwasi Kwarteng also eased the stamp duty on her home purchases, and that's likely to help home builders and 200,000 buyers a year. And he lifted the cap on bankers' bonuses. In Ukraine, voting starts today in four Russian-occupied territories on whether to join Russia. Ukraine and its allies have blasted the votes as shams. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said, quote, we will not allow President Putin to get away with it. Hong Kong is making its biggest move yet into the push to end its pandemic isolation. The city is scrapping hotel quarantine for inbound travelers starting next week. In the three days after they get to Hong Kong, travelers will face restrictions on their movements, among them not going to bars and eating at restaurants. Meanwhile, Singapore has overtaken Hong Kong to become Asia's top financial center. That's according to the Global Financial Centers Index. Hong Kong's COVID curbs have hurt, while Singapore has been attracting a number of high-profile events. New York and London have the first two spots in the rankings, followed by Singapore, Hong Kong, and San Francisco. And Boeing has agreed to pay $200 million to settle the SEC investigation into 737 MAX safety issues. Former CEO Dennis Mullenberg will pay $1 million as part of the agreement. Regulators say Boeing and Mullenberg failed to disclose problems with the 737 MAX, which was involved in two fatal crashes. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Next year's planned increase in corporation tax will be cancelled. Yeah. The corporation tax rate will not rise to 25%. It will remain at 19% and we will have the lowest rate of corporation tax in the G20. Yeah. This will plough almost £19 billion a year 
back into the economy. Some pretty shocking policy changes from Kwasi Kwarteng, UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. As the UK outlines how they are going to cut taxes, the most going back to 1973, also uh, deal with some of the banker bonuses by scrapping them and raising a lot of questions about how this is going to play in the markets. It is playing with a pound that is falling absolutely out of bed, new uh, post 1985 weakness. As people uh, take a look at the prospects of foreign investors financing this nation, it comes as there's a general wholesale flood into the dollar. The euro also weaker versus the dollar, 97.68, just shocking at a time when some people are calling for it to go to 95 or even 90, depending on how bad the winter is. You're seeing the risk off tone permeate through the end of the week. S&P down eight tenths of a percent, 37.40. And the 10 year yield, I just can't get over this, 3.74 percent right now. It has risen from two and a half percent at the beginning of August and from 1.6 percent at the beginning of the year. It has more than doubled at a time when people are wondering what is going to stop it from going even further. We have to talk about the United Kingdom. And Lizzie Burden has been covering all of this. She's at Abington Green for us here at Bloomberg. This is a package that is causing a complete reset in UK assets. It's also creating a reset in some of the social landscape of this nation. Lizzie, what sticks out to you in this vast plan that was put out there by Liz Truss's administration? Well, do you know what's the truth? A whole of, a lot of our viewers in the UK just got a whole lot richer. You've got Kwasi Kwarteng scrapping the 45% top rate of income tax. He scrapped the caps on bankers' bonuses. It's £45 billion worth of tax cuts. If you earn more than a million pounds a year in the UK, you're getting a 55 thousand pound tax cut next year which is twice what a typical earner earns in a year that's according to the resolution foundation and he's doing it while he's cutting benefits for people who aren't doing enough to find a job in the middle of a cost of living crisis all in the name of growth which is a huge gamble as you say politically liz truss says she doesn't mind being unpopular but she's got to be popular by the election in 2024 and it's an economic gamble as well you've talked about the uh, tanking bonds, tanking pound. We spoke to Martin Wheel, the former Bank of England policymaker yesterday. I have to say that he is one of the most known as one of the most level headed Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee alumni. And he said it's all going to end in tears. Take a listen to what he said. We've had other previous experiences where you know, chancellors have gone for growth. The most famous examples were the dash for growth in the 1960s and then the barber boom in the 1970s, and they both ended in tears. And I must say, I expect the same sort of thing will happen with Kvarteng's policy, that there'll probably be, or I wouldn't like to say when, there'll probably be a clear run on the pound, and then the Bank of England will be forced to put up interest rates to stabilise the exchange rate, you no, know, much as we had in 1976. So you heard from Martin Wheel, former Bank of England policymaker, there expressing his concerns about what this is going to do in markets. But we've just heard from Kwasi Kwarteng. He says uh, that markets are going to do what they do. So uh, <laughs> he's going to crack on with the job regardless. It's amazing to me that he can just say, yeah, it is what it is when you're seeing your currency drop to the weakest level since 1985, Lizzie. And on this fiscal question, it creates a huge issue for monetary policymakers. The Bank of England just hiked 50 basis points yesterday. The market is now pricing an 80 percent chance of them going 100 basis points, double that in November. How do Andrew Bailey and co respond to policy like this on the fiscal side? Well, what we heard from the Monetary Policy Committee yesterday was that they were leaving the door open to future hikes. They said that they would assess the impact of this mini-budget in their November decision. Goldman had already said before this mini-budget that they saw 75 basis points in November and December. I reckon you'll see a lot of economists changing their calls today. Uh, it ha it, there was such a big vote split on the committee that it wouldn't have taken a lot of movement to get a bigger hike down the line. And crucially, if you look at the guidance that came out alongside the decision. They said that, yes, they're pre prepared to respond forcefully if inflationary pressures persist. They'd already said that. But now they're saying that uh, they're looking out for inflationary pressures, including from stronger demand. So a bit of a side eye at the Treasury anticipating the inflationary impact of this mini budget.
Lizzie, how are corporates and households really reacting to this? I mean, are they are they a fan of Liz Truss's plan? I mean, do they believe that the BOE is going too far? I mean, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts here. Uh, well, you could ask the same of the mini budget, and we're going to have to see. Truss's hope is that the energy bailouts for consumers and businesses are going to win the hearts of the voters on that side, uh, whilst also in introducing all of these measures that will hopefully boost the city of London post Brexit uh, and mean that the bankers come flooding back. Uh, but the Bank of England is going to have to deal with the blowback if this uh, package overheats the economy. Lizzie Burden of Bloomberg, thank you so much uh, for this. And you'll be joining us again uh, later in the show. I appreciate that. Damien, to your point, the social response really is fascinating. Torsten Bell, who's the CEO over at Resolution Foundation, put out this tweet that I thought was fascinating. Any of you earn a million pounds, you're getting a 55 pound, a 55,000 pound tax cut next year, twice what a typical earner brings home a year. You know very well from your sector the social pressures that can rise in a circumstance like this. I mean, how much are people looking at the UK increasing like a, like an emerging market currency when you take a look at the pound. I mean, when, it's exactly right. When I when I when I look at the UK now, I'm thinking Chile. I'm thinking uh, the social unrest we're seeing in other places on the planet. I mean, maybe not to that extent, but certainly, you know, the path is there. You know, that po populist pivot that we saw throughout Latin America that's still ongoing is really now reaching uh, Europe shores and it's reaching the UK in my mind. Well, how much pushback? And Damien, we've been looking at a bunch of rate hikes from a lot of developing markets and particularly front loading ahead of the Fed. How much how much pushback is there socially at this point to some of those moves? Well, you know, it's really quite interesting, and you're bringing up a great point. We saw a host of central banks move on the heels of the Fed this just this week, but the one that really catches my eye was Brazil. Brazil was way ahead of the curve in terms of hiking rates ahead of the Fed, and look at the reaction. I mean, I mean, to, uh, in terms of the Brazilian real uh, dollar cross rate, it's really not gone anywhere. In fact, the real is the um, best performing currency in the world this year, and there it goes. Honestly, this has been the issue. Rich Clarida, former vice chair of the Fed, saying they are watching the rest of the world, not the U.S., for something breaking. Coming up, we'll talk about that with Derek Maher, head of research uh, for the Americas and head of FX strategy at HSBC Securities. As you take a look, the S&P deepening some of those losses ahead of the open, down now about 1.1 percent. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Kane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Today we have Kaylee Lines and Damian Sassauer with us on a soggy finish to a very difficult week. A reset as we take a look at what's happening with the expectations for a Federal Reserve. What you're seeing in the markets is a pretty dire response. This week alone, S&P futures are poised for a more than 4% loss. Just giving you some perspective, the S&P is down more than 13% or will be so far since the middle of August, just based on some of the retracement. The Nasdaq down, poised for a 4.3 percent loss on the week and you can see Russell also following in with this this all has to do with yields we've been talking about that John's been talking about how the poison is at the front end very much so but it's also uh, generally about what's going on with yields broadly not just at the front end and you can see it's in the U.S. right and you are seeing intraday the yields continue to climb with a 30-year yield now 3.67 percent 10 year yields 3.8 percent but the real issue is the United Kingdom we are looking at a British market that is falling out of bed on some of the biggest tax cuts being proposed going back to 1973 at a time of rapid inflation and the potential now increasingly priced into the market for a 100 basis point rate hike at the next meeting. Kaylee, this really highlights some of the pain. It does highlight the pain. And the question is, if you have that kind of fiscal policy, what on earth can monetary policy makers do to stem the bleeding? Is even a 100 basis point rate hike from the Bank of England enough to support the British pound? And that's the reason why you're seeing five-year yields climb 46 basis points on the day to 4% and 10-year uh, yields to 3.75%. 26 basis points on the day, which brings us to the currency and the pound has been just absolutely hammered. And we've been talking about this and Damien, you were saying it's trading like an emerging market currency. Well, here you go. This is the British pound going back to 1985. It climbed at one point uh, up to almost two <laughs> for the dollar. And now 
We're talking parity. We're talking 111. We're talking 112. But we're talking there isn't necessarily a sense of what's going to be happening, Damien. And that's, I think, what people are really getting concerned about. Yeah, well, King Dollar has been a thorn in the side of all international creditors, not just pound investors as well. So, look, I mean, I think what's interesting yesterday is that move in gilts really blew out to the rest of the world. If you look at fixed income curves in the U.S. and Europe abroad. And so my question is really, is there more to come? All right. Well, Kaylee, maybe we can get some answers of that. Well, we can at the very least try to. Dara Mar, head of Research Americas and FX Strategy at HSBC Securities, is joining us now. We have cable, sub 111, 110.79 right now on uh, d the pound versus the U.S. dollar. Is parity realistic? Yeah, it, it's look, who's going to rule out a number when things are moving this quickly? Um, and do you look at the fundamentals and um, you you're describing them. Well, look, what I think is interesting here is that the currency market, at least for sterling, has taken on, if you like, the structural view. Uh, the UK's external imbalance, uh, the current account plus FDI is like 8% deficit of GDP. And now you've added on the fiscal deficit and concerns on that front and, you know, obviously captured in those guilt yields. And so you have that, you know, the twin deficit story that people always throw barbs at the US dollar on. This is the UK story, because if you're purely on a cyclical angle, you'd be like, hey, this could be good for sterling. You know, it's, it's, it's hawkish for rates, it's bullish for growth, let's buy sterling. But clearly, it's the structural parameters that are absolutely dominant, at least in the UK market. So, yeah, um, who's going to rule out parity? I mean, our forecast is we get to 108, and, um, and I guess then we'll have to reassess. But, um, okay, the one thing I would caution on mm. is there is a tendency when things move to get super excited and say this will go forever. Um, so... <laughs> You know, we need to be a little bit mindful of that. But for now, sure, the momentum is in that direction. Well, what's stopping it from going forever, though? Because it doesn't seem like central bankers are going to be the ones to do that because we've seen the hikes, not just from the BOE, but really central banks across the board. And those hikes are not supportive of the currencies. It is just dollar strength, full stop. What stops that? Well, I don't, I don't think there's a great deal in the way of, of dollar strength. And as you know, we've been uh, dollar bulls for, for a long time, upwards of a year, year and a half. Um, one of the curiosities, though, I've noticed in this dollar bull rally is when I've gone to see clients or talked about it, the question I tend to get is, is it, hey, have we reached the peak? And rather than, can this go another 10% higher? It's kind of like the, you know, the road trip where you're only out of the garage and the kids are already asking, are we there yet? We've had this, <laughs> are we there yet, you know, in this dollar rally. Now, what is of slight concern for a dollar bull like me is, now we're getting the questions, hey, do you think we can go to parity on cable or you know, how low can we go on euro? And, you know, it's we're not getting that kind of reticence. And, of course, that can be a sign that things are getting a little exhausted. I still think we've got some ways to go on, on dollar strength because you've got a hawkish Fed, you've got a global economic slowdown, you've got risk aversion. They're the three drivers to our dollar view. And until they change, we won't change. Darren, you have a BOJ that's just not going to abandon its pledge to cap yields. I mean, what should we make of dollar yen at 143 here? Well, look, uh, it's a Japan, Japan is a peculiar case, isn't it? Ordinarily, with with the risk aversion we're seeing, the yen historically has done okay. Um, what's of course killed at this time around is that risk aversion has been accompanied by rising U.S. yields rather than declining U.S. yields. And you know, as you point out, the BOJ is sticking to its guns on its uh, monetary easing for the next two to three years, they told us earlier this week. So that divergence is prominent. So in terms of what we can expect for dollar yen, it, it might actually boil down to the Ministry of Finance. How ambitious are they in capping dollar yen? And also, I think we'll reach a point where the market will look at the yen and say, hey, if we're in a global recession scenario, if that mount is mounting, the yen's a pretty cheap safe haven at this point. And, you know, if we set aside monetary policy, historically the yen has done pretty well. And maybe we're exhausted on the dollar. Let's look for some other safe havens. But that doesn't feel particularly, I would say, imminent. Um, so I think, yeah, the pressure will be for dollar yen higher uh, with the MOF, I think, trying to introduce two-way traffic periodically. Dara, it's, it's difficult to read too far into some of the price action yesterday. I'm talking on the fixed income markets. But, you know, there are other countries like India and Chile that come to mind that have been intervening in their currency markets to defend. And so my question for you is, you know, can we expect some sort of a coordinated effort here? Is there something like a 1985 Plaza Accord in our future? Uh, that feels a stretch. I mean, because, of course, the key to the Plaza Accord was the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. And we have the Fed is still battling inflation. Um 
you're coming up to midterm elections in the U.S. Is the Treasury going to get on board with something that potentially adds to U.S. inflation uh, issues by weakening the U.S. dollar? That seems improbable. I, I suspect the angle I would have thought for yen intervention and, if you like, the contagion element is simply people in, in your industry, you're going to keep quizzing central bankers about currencies now. You're going to, you know, Lagarde's going to get asked about the euro. Everyone's going to get asked about sterling. And it's a question of, is this complicating your life in terms of trying to manage inflation and get inflation lower? And what can you do about it? Those kind of questions, I think, are going to be front and center. I don't think the U.S. is going to be part of that narrative. They don't want to be. Uh, but it does, of course, raise the specter of currency war, which is now a new fashionable term once again. Of course, there's a question of how to fight that war, Derek. I mean, we heard from uh, Kaylee mentioned earlier that there's now a 50 percent chance being priced into futures that the Bank of England raises by 100 basis points in November. If they do that, if there's an outsized rate hike, what happens to the currency? Does the pound strengthen or does it weaken even further because that just inflicts that much more pain on the economy? I think the pound would soar for at least two minutes. <laughs> um, what a projection. You know, we, we, we saw that. Look, we saw that. We had the Swedish Riksbank earlier this week. They did 100 basis points, and, and Stocky went, went absolutely ballistic. And then 20 minutes later, we'd reversed fully, and it was weakening. And now, you know, dollar stock is just powering higher because at the end of the day, these currencies are no longer trading on relative rates. Dollar yen is the exception. Most G10 currencies are trading on risk appetite. Most G10 currencies are trading on the domestic growth outlook. Um, and so long as they both remain challenging, then rate hikes aren't going to rescue you. They, they'll obviously help in the inflation fight, but from a currency perspective, you know, we're seeing mismatches on euro dollar relative to two year swap differentials on cable by some distance, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, across most of G10. Now, dollar bears say, well, that's why the dollar is overvalued and it's going to retreat. My perspective is this just demonstrates that the relative rate story is not at the heart of FX anymore. It's about global growth. It's about Fed hawkishness and it's about risk appetite. OK, so how do you then fight a reverse currency war? You can't. I mean, well, you can fight it, but you can't win it. Um, you know, these are our global market forces. And, you know, I, OK, you can argue what, what can you do Well, you can try and moderate the impact. And, and that's what the MOF in Japan, I guess, that's their aspiration. That might be their measure of success is, you know, OK, we can't turn dollar yen around on a sustainable basis. We're fighting pretty profound fundamentals. But can we at least introduce two-way traffic, not allow this to become a, a self-fulfilling spiral downwards for the yen? And I think that's maybe what other currency um, um, or central banks, I should say, will try to do with the currencies. They'll introduce verbal rhetoric. They'll talk about how the exchange rate is an important consideration when setting interest rates. They'll say we're closely watching all of the, all of the things we've heard from the, from the MOF. We are likely to hear from the ECB and the Bank of England and others. But at the end of the day, it comes back to the dollar. And it comes back, as I keep saying, to the, to the Fed, to global growth, and to risk appetite. And until they change or at least you know, stop moving in the direction they're moving currently, mm. then I think it's going to be hard to fight the dominant dollar. Derek Maher of HSBC Securities, thank you so much. You can't fight it. Thank that, you. Damien, seems to be uh, the tone out here, which is the reason why you're seeing increasing bearishness, not necessarily even emerging markets, but developed market currencies, just anything other than the U.S. Yeah, Lisa, I mean, it's this pivot from the inflation story to the growth story. It's never been a smooth pivot, and this time is no different. I mean, honestly, this is hard to see, Kaylee, how this transpires. And you asked the question earlier, where is the stopping point? It doesn't feel like there is one, and certainly the moves that you've been picking out today in the U.K. market seem to indicate that's the case. In the U.K., when we're looking at 110 on the cable rate, in China, where we're looking at 712 on dollar yuan, I mean, I get the sense in currencies everywhere, just a loss of control on the part of policymakers. The PBOC keeps trying to set stronger reference rates. It's not doing anything. Japan tries to intervene. The yen is still weaker. Central banks in the West are hiking. It is not doing anything to support the currencies. And I know I'm a control freak, but that loss of control makes me feel a little panicky. <laughs> I think a lot of people are control <laughs> freaks right now. How do you reverse a currency war? How could you fight a reverse currency war? You can't. That, to me, might be one of the quotes of the morning as we take a look at markets that are in a world of pain. Coming up, Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy from New York. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. The last time the UK saw tax cuts like this, it was 1988 and Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. Chancellor of the Exchequer Kwasi Kwarteng is cutting taxes on workers pay and corporations. The goal is to boost the long term potential of the economy. Kwarteng also cut the stamp tax on property purchases and he's doing away with the cap on bankers bonuses. The special master in the Trump documents case has ordered the former president's lawyers to state in a court filing whether they believe the FBI is lying about the papers. In effect, Judge Raymond Deary is demanding that Donald Trump's lawyers back up his claims that the FBI planted items during the search of his Florida home. Japan is moving to revive its tourist industry in the wake of the pandemic. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says a slew of COVID border controls will be abolished next month. Individual visitors will be allowed to enter and Japan will reinstate visa waivers. The cap on daily arrivals will also be ended. Some of Wall Street's biggest banks see oil rebounding in the fourth quarter. J.P. Morgan Chase is forecasting Brent crude at $101 a barrel the final three months of the year. Goldman Sachs is targeting $125. Brent is trading around $90 today. Analysts say low inventories and sustained demand will keep prices elevated despite concerns of a global slowdown. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think we're now at a point where, given the significant rises in, um, in interest rates and yields across the yield curve since the beginning of the year, the equity market is now focused much less on inflation and yields than it is on earnings. Insightful comments from Abby Joseph Cohen, professor at the Columbia Business School, longtime partner at Goldman Sachs, talking about how the focus is shifting, trying to look for some data in the underlying earnings that we're getting in, for example, FedEx. Uh, Kaylee, yesterday, it was really just sort of confirming some of the fears that people already had. Well, of course, we had already heard from them last week about the deteriorating macro macroeconomic picture hurting demand. So as a result, what FedEx said yesterday is, look, we're going to try to cut costs to the tune of about $2.7 billion. What I thought was interesting, though, Lee, is they also want to raise prices. They want to raise rates. How does that work in a demand destructive environment? Does that not just kind of have the opposite of the intended effect? How do you exercise that pricing power in an environment like this one? And it's a really good point because there's a social aspect here too. And Terry Haynes has been tracking this, which is we're dealing with stagflation. We're dealing with this concern that a lot of companies are going to be dealing with margin pressures, trying to pass it along. At the same time that you have interest rates rising and a fiscal landscape that is fraught. Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy, joining us uh, right now. And Terry, we're looking at that in the United Kingdom as a great example example or perhaps a terrible example of what happens at least by the reflection of the currency market and the bond markets in the face of a fiscal policy trying to uh, give more and focus on growth and a monetary policy going in the opposite direction. Yeah, I think that's right. The uh, you know, I've been writing about this for a while, as you know, the uh, for the first time in a generation we've got a, a serious divergence uh, between monetary policy and fiscal policy, and there, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that that are uh, the, in the abstract good ones. Uh, the UK wants to stimulate growth. The UK is very interested in making sure that its citizens don't freeze this winter. And l let's remember that part of Chancellor Quarteng's uh, package uh, that was first discussed is uh, what was uh, what was energy price caps and the like to uh, to help tide people over for this winter. Uh, but you know it's going to be very difficult. But whether you whether it's trust in the UK, whether it's uh, Biden in the United States, uh, whether it's the European Union, the European Commission, uh, we have this problem across the board. And you know in the UK, it's a bet that growth overcomes the risks and the problems. And uh, and in the United States, it's really uh, kind of the opposite, making sure that uh, what you have is you have you know particular policies uh, that have their uh, the, that that get filled up and uh, and have the ability to uh, uh, to be properly funded, whether it's uh, rehoming semiconductors or uh, right. or pushing green policies. Uh, but yeah, yeah, but there's uh, 
you know, it's a whole new world for an awful lot of people that uh, have, weren't around in the 70s and 80s, that's for sure. If we could continue the conversation on the United States, Terry, obviously the Federal Reserve is hiking rates, trying to fight inflation. At the same time, you have policymakers in Washington, like Elizabeth Warren, saying, I'm worried they're doing too much because they are going to raise the unemployment rate. They're going to hurt the American consumer. How do the politics of inflation, which have been difficult for the Democrats to this point, match up against the politics of hurting the economy to fight inflation? Which one is worse? politically as we get closer to the midterms? Well, what you've got is a situation where uh, where President Biden and the Democrats very much wanted the, uh, the, the new Fed. Let's remember five out of these seven governors uh, had to wait for six months uh, to be uh, to, to be renominated and reconfirmed. Uh, and, you know, that that tracked the uh, the time in which inflation really started to uh, to dig in. Uh, and become entrenched, uh, but you know it's 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 bad timing for Democrats certainly. Uh, but Democrats really wanted a uh, a much more uh, dovish Fed, and what happened is uh, I think that the the Fed was uh, the, the incoming Fed was very good at keeping its cards close to the vest. But once they got confirmed, then uh, they decided it was time to do their jobs that Congress gave them. Uh, the first mandate here in the in the so-called dual mandate is. Uh, is attacking inflation, and that's exactly what the Fed is doing. Uh, you know, fiscal policymakers are now complaining, in essence, that uh, they no longer have uh, the free hand that they had before, uh, and that's true enough. Uh, but it's going to require the fiscal policymakers to start thinking creatively, and again, for the first time in a generation, and not simply uh, continuing to throw money at things and uh, call problems solved. Terry, I know these are rough estimates heading into the November midterms, but there's a 40 percent probability of an all Republican, 40 percent probability of sort of a split and 20 percent that there's an all Democratic Congress. What's the best outcome for asset prices? Uh, Damien, to be to be perfectly clear, those are the, the, the those are my prognostications, not yours. So if they're wrong, then the, the blame is mine. Um, the you know, generally speaking, what you're going to end up with is that you're going to end up with very little changing in Washington in a real sense. Uh, you know, if, if it's 40% uh, Republicans, those are very tiny majorities, and they run up against the Democratic president. If there's a split Congress, uh, then you, you get very little done domestically. And even if there's a tiny Democratic Congress, as you've just seen, all Democratic Congress, as you've just seen over the last two years, uh, it's very difficult for those folks to, uh, to, get, to figure out between the progressive and the centrist Democratic coalitions exactly what their priorities are and exactly what their willing to do. Uh, so, you know, net net, uh, you know, my experience has been that, uh, you know, sort of confused uh, do nothing Congresses domestically uh, generally are, are, are not bad for asset prices. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I should also mention that I think uh, it, regardless of outcome, uh, unanimity on foreign policy, whether it be Russia, Ukraine or China or anything else continues as well. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy, thank you so much. Uh, Damien, the mood right now, just to give you a snapshot from Twitter. Gila Boss over at Jenny, uh, basically, stuff's breaking, more stuff's <laughs> breaking. And Paul McNamara, who I know uh, you probably are familiar with, Emerging Markets veteran uh, over at GAM Limited, put out this gif that I can't really quote on air because <laughs> I'll be fined, but he said, mood, everything is bleep, and also something is on fire. But that seems to be the mood <laughs> that you could see pretty steadily across Twitter. Yeah, no, for me, it's gonna be about the plumbing, right? Is something breaking? You know, our market's clearing, our credit market's clearing. I mean, spreads haven't really gone yet, Lisa. Yeah. We all know this, we've been talking about this a while. I'm going to be hyper-focused on spreads in the short end and both um, in, in IG and high-yield credit. Yeah, and a lot of people are looking at that just to talk about things breaking, and that's not where you're seeing things break. Kayla, you were pointing out five-year gilt yields, and it looks as if they have risen almost half a percentage point in one day, which looks like it may be the most going back to at least 1991. If you just take a look at the pace of moves, the pace of an exodus from the bond market in the United Kingdom. It's truly alarming. I mean, I almost don't believe I'm looking at an intraday chart when I am looking at the moves we are seeing in the gilt market, in the sovereign market. But to Damien's point on credit, you really aren't seeing that blowout. You still have high yield spread sub 500 basis points. We've heard from Bob Michael over at JP Morgan, for example, saying realistically that should be something like 750. I'm wondering what all other asset classes seem to be getting in terms of messaging that hasn't shown up in credit yet. And if it's not showing up in credit, 
credit, is there anything going on right now that is going to cause the Federal Reserve to blink? And this really goes to a point that Bank of America's Michael Hartnett put out overnight, where he was talking about some of the recent flows in the great bond market, the third great bond bear market, talking about how there are some potential threats to liquidation events. But this quote stands out to me. True capitulation is when investors sell what they love and what they own. Right now, you see the S&P futures deepening some of those losses down nearly 1.4%. The euro continuing uh, to trade at a 97 handle uh, versus the dollar. This is Bloomberg. Every central bank is competing with every other to bring inflation down quickly. There, there's a lot of confusion. Investors are not sure how this is going to play out. We're finding real opportunities. There has been carnage in this market. It's all about the rate of change, and I think that's what really central banks would react to. The government's really taking a gamble here that the policies that it's implementing are going to do something to boost growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A deepening sense of doom. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. I hear that uh, Tom Keene and Jonathan Farrow have stopped watching Ted Lasso. And now John has convinced Tom to watch reruns of Spurs instead. Just his research. We are very lucky today. We have Kaylee Lyons and Damian Sassauer in the house on a day when markets very much front and focus. Kaylee, things are deteriorating rapidly after already resetting through the week, through the month. You call it deteriorating, Lisa. Some people might call it breaking. We are seeing a real breakdown specifically in the UK today with the cable right now at a 110 handle after fiscal policy announcements from the government, the new government in the UK. And the five-year gilt yield on the day is up 47 basis points. These are just unbelievable market moves, Lisa, and it's really everywhere you look. So breaking, that's actually a really important word because so many people have come out, Kaylee, and said until things break, the Federal Reserve is not going to blink. They are not going to pause. They may not even slow. Does this count toward that breaking? I wonder if it matters what thing it is that is breaking, if it's the labor market that looks like it's breaking, which it does not look like yet, even if we have seen some softening, if it is the credit market, which looks like it's breaking, which to this point, it doesn't really yet. It's a lot concentrated in foreign exchange and in the government bond markets. And I wonder if the Federal Reserve is looking at this saying, OK, well, this is kind of what we thought would happen when you understood how much we're really going to tighten. And Damian, this goes to the point that you were making. Credit is not breaking. You're not seeing credit spreads blow out. You still are seeing people say it's actually a great time to buy because you're getting yield. Why has credit been so resilient? Well, that's a good question. I mean, look, the fact of the matter is they're relatively liquid when you look at it relative to FX and treasuries, right? So it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot to move the needle there. I imagine uh, after some of the price action we've seen over the last few days, you're going to start to see things slide. The question is, how far do they slide? Wait, so This is a really important point, Damien. You're saying that perhaps it's just that things are not trading enough to really get a true sense, that there isn't necessarily the forced sales, that people have been able to avoid triggers. What will be the trigger if a bear market, unlike anything we've seen in modern history, isn't enough to do it? Well, I mean, look, I mean, it's far be it for me to judge, but for me, it's always going to be about the plumbing. You know, I started my career in, the, in, in money markets at Goldman Sachs. So, you know, I mean, I'm talking tri-party repo. I'm looking at, you know, specials versus GC spreads. I mean, those are the kind of things that you have to look at for indicators of whether or not the plumbing is working properly. Right now, it seems to be. But, you know, again, you know, if, as you r rightly point out, I mean, if we see forced selling from fund, uh, from retail investors and institutions alike, you know, the credit markets could start to snap here. Right now, what we're seeing is very much pain across the board, particularly when it comes to the United Kingdom market. Just taking a look at futures right now, they are down. They are continuing to decline throughout the morning, down 1.4 percent on the S&P. NASDAQ deteriorating even more, 1.5 percent. But really, what we're looking at is in the United Kingdom, five-year yields climbing by nearly 50 50 basis points, but nearly half a percentage point, uh, up nearly 4.1%. to 4, 4 The pound absolutely hammered down 2% versus the dollar, 110 handle. How much are we going to hear about parity at a time when people are looking at the biggest tax cuts in that nation going back to 1974? And crude off Kaylee as we take a look, down 3%, taking a look, that's Brent, uh, to 87.73. As people look toward deteriorating backdrop, people not spending as much much growth slowing. It's really bleak. It is a bleak, bleak morning. I mean, it's right everywhere you look. And to your point on parity on the cable rate, what stops these moves in foreign exchange? What can stop the strength of the U.S. dollar, at least at this point? The answer seems to be 
nothing yet. Now, as for what is ahead on the day today in terms of what we should be looking at events wise, 9.45 a.m. We are going to get a little bit of economic data here in the U.S. in the form of preliminary September PMIs. What we're likely going to see is contraction territory again on the services metric as well as the composite softening in the data we are seeing, which of course is in part intended as we see the Federal Reserve tightening policy. In terms of the Federal Reserve, we will be hearing from the man himself, Jerome Powell, for the second time this week. He'll be speaking at 2 p.m. Eastern time at a Fed's Listen event. Is he just going to repeat himself? Like he repeated much of what he said in Jackson Hole at the uh, press conference this week. His message is we are going to keep going. We are going to fight inflation and ultimately it will be enough. Is he now happy that the market seems to be more on board with his and his uh, team's messaging on that front? Then finally, looking ahead through this weekend, Sunday is a day to watch in Italy with the election. It is likely going to be Georgia Maloney, the far right candidate who ultimately wins that along with her far right coalition. She has said she is going to stick with the fiscal policy of Mario Draghi, but there remains some serious questions around what actually governance translation will look like in terms of how it compares to what she has been saying rhetoric rise. That is a lot of concern around Euro, uh, the Eurozone, considering she is somewhat of a Euro skeptic. So definitely something that the markets are going to be watching in the days ahead, Lisa. Kaylee, thank you so much. It is a morning of fear. It is also a morning of revision, and it has been a week of revision for Wall Street uh, strategists across the board with Goldman Sachs slashing its year-end target for the S&P 500 to 3,600. It previously had been 4,300, a pretty big revision. Julian Manuel, equity derivatives and quantitative strategist at Evercore ISI, has been out ahead of some of what we have been seeing. Julian, have you reset some of your expectations based on the Fed meeting this week? Oh, we we certainly have. Look, we're calling for earnings next year uh, basically to be flat year on year uh, with this year. And, and frankly, we were below consensus and continue to be below consensus uh, for 2022 as well. And obviously, uh, we slashed our price target. And it's one of these years that now, actually, Wednesday has ushered in the emotional phase uh, of this bear market, uh, which, frankly, every bear market does tend to have an emotional phase, uh, simply because when you look at uh, what the Fed chair said and the projections, and importantly, it's that unemployment number projected to be 4.4 percent next year, uh, where the rate of change there's never not been a recession following hard upon that kind of change. And all of that has caused this, the emotion to come into the markets and subsequently, of course, these types of revisions. You know, I mean, Julian, I mean, rising bond yields, higher commodity prices, these have been the two dominant factors that are impacting U.S. equity earnings. I'm wondering the pace of equity earning uh, downward revisions. Are, are we comfortable with that? I mean, is it going to accelerate over the next few months? Well, it, it's actually less about the pace than the band of uncertainty. So if you look at uh, estimates for next year, they range from 185 on the low end to 255 on the high end. That's absolutely unprecedented, and it speaks to the uncertainty in all asset markets. And again, frankly, when you think about it and you see the screen, uh, you know, everything is red today, and that tells you that uncertainty really is approaching those critical levels. Well, Julian, on the earnings side, we have been having the conversation for some time now that there is inflationary pressure, higher input costs. It's going to weigh on corporate margins. They aren't going to be able to pass it on. And yet it's been actually okay to this point. Why would things change now as we're seeing some of those inflationary pressures winding down a bit? Why is it now ultimately that those margin pressures are really going to come through? Is it just an inability on the demand side to be passing those costs on to the end customer? So, Kaylee, if, if you think about this year, it's been very unusual in that the sentiment data on the consumer side has been, you know, subdued, you know, worse than subdued the entire year because of the consumers sort of internalizing uh, the idea of inflation. But yet the spend has been, you know, really quite reasonable uh, when you think about it. That, in our view, is about to change uh, because, frankly, conditions are really warranting uh, a little bit more of a, a button-down uh, type of attitude. And to th that point, that's where the attack on margins, the attack on, you know, volumes comes in and, again, uh, the risk in markets. 
but the story is that this is part of uh, the Fed's calculus. Uh, the, the question being, though, uh, are we in the process of potentially breaking something? Well, Julian, to that point, let's begin where we started. Uh, let's uh, end where we started, rather, where you said this marks the emotional phase of this bear market. What are we currently pricing in? How long will the recession be? How deep? The idea of a soft landing or at least a shallow recession, is that kind of off the table? It's not entirely off the table. What we think the Fed may have been missing, uh, and, and it's our view, that inflation is actually starting to come in. Whether you measure it uh, by break-evens, uh, you know, there's a disconnect uh, between the fact that embedded inflation expectations simply aren't there. And in this respect, this is not the 1970s. Uh, and in our view, we think the data over the next couple of months will reflect that. Is it going to happen quick enough for the Fed not to do 50 or 75 uh, on November 2nd? Possibly not. Uh, but frankly, uh, we think that that type of reckoning is out there in the future. And that's the kind of psychology that could forestall or make any recession in 2023 a more shallow event. Julian Emanuel, uh, by the way, I just want to tell you that Damian Sassauer decided to wear his Yankees tie specifically for you and for me, <laughs> knowing our affinity toward the Mets. Just Aaron to Judge create, watches just fine. You know? <laughs> just to create Triple a little crown. tension on an already tense day. Thanks, Damian. Just want to let you know. Julian Emanuel, thank you so much for being with us. And it really is a moment of reset where people start to downgrade their expectations for where we expect the S&P, but also what we're seeing in commodities. And I really want to go back to that. Just a, a viewer a, making a note about how copper is down 4%, yeah. really highlighting Dr. Copper raising some alarms, Kaylee, about what could happen in the global economy. The idea of demand destruction if central banks take this too far. I thought it was so interesting on Wednesday when Mike McKee, our very own, asked Jerome Powell, how are you going to know if you've gone too far? His answer was basically like, we, we can't, we won't know. That is not something we're capable of. And if you have the central banks tightening aggressively and that lagged effect means it's already too late, that means destruction in the economy. And that's not good for commodities prices and prices for a lot of other assets as well. I think, Kaylee, that sitting in that chair makes people vaguely catastrophic <laughs> and very having a trouble. For with, the record, uh, I'm, in, I'm yeah. in Lisa's chair. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's got it's something magic in its blood <laughs> that just sort of makes you feel vaguely depressed. Coming up at 8 a.m., Dan Suzuki, a deputy CIO at Richard Bernstein <laughs> Advisors, weighing in on the great reset of this week. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Liz Truss's government has come out with the most radical set of tax cuts since 1988. Both workers and companies will see their taxes reduced. Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng, also eased the stamp duty on home purchases. That's likely to help home builders and 200,000 buyers a year. And he lifted the cap on bankers' bonuses. Russia's President Vladimir Putin wants to spend far more on the military in the next two years than initially planned. That's because of increasingly costly war in Ukraine. According to a plan seen by Bloomberg, defense spending is now set to exceed next year's initial budget assumptions by more than 43 percent. Hong Kong is making its biggest move yet in the push to end its pandemic isolation. The city is scrapping hotel quarantine for inbound travelers starting next week. In the three days after they get to Hong Kong, travelers will still face restrictions on their movements, among them no going to bars and eating at restaurants. The special master in the Trump documents case has ordered the former president's lawyers to state in a court filing whether they believe the FBI is lying about the papers. In effect, Judge Raymond Deary is demanding that Donald Trump's lawyers back up his claims that the FBI planted items during the search of his Florida home. And FedEx is cutting costs and increasing its rates. The giant package carrier is looking for as much as $2.7 billion in savings to deal with slowing demand and a tight labor market. Last week, FedEx shares suffered their worst one day in 40 years after the company pointed to worsening economic conditions. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The total cost of the energy package for the six months from October is expected to be around £60 billion. 
We expect the cost to come down as we negotiate new long-term energy contracts yeah. with suppliers. And in the context of a global energy crisis. Quasi Quartang, UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, laying out some of the new proposals from the United Kingdom, which have only exacerbated the pain that we're seeing in the pound and certainly guilt across the board. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden at Abington Green has been tracking all of this, and she actually was uh, experiencing a, a big sound of ABBA, which money, money, money behind her, a protester, uh, until just uh, recently when the police pulled him away. But there is a question here about some of the social tensions that are rising. Uh, given the exodus of foreign money and the concerns with inflation. Well, it's a rich man's world, according to the guy behind me, and he's referring to the Chancellor's budget uh, because we have seen the scrapping of the corporation tax rise, a scrapping of the cap on bankers' bonuses, and a scrapping of the 45% top rate of income tax. So a lot of our viewers are going to be a lot richer. Uh, but it's at the same time as Kwarteng has cut benefits for people who he thinks are not doing enough to find a job in the middle of a cost of living crisis. It's a huge gamble. Politically, Liz Truss says she doesn't mind being unpopular, but she needs to be popular. Every politician does, especially by 2024. That's when an election's due. And don't forget, no one voted for Liz Truss among the population. She was chosen by her party. But it's also an economic gamble. You've seen markets crashing in the UK as a result, bonds and sterling tanking. And now we're seeing traders pricing in 100 basis points at the BOE's next meeting in November. We spoke to Martin Weil, the former Bank of England policymaker, yesterday. He warned us about this. He said that there's going to be a run on the pound as a result. But quasi that was actually brought up in the parliamentary debate after the mini budget. But quasi Quarteng says markets are going to do what they will. So uh, it looks like markets are just going to have to uh, crack on just as quasi Quarteng does. Crack on, they are, and it is not very uh, pretty right now. Lizzie Burden, thank you so much for being with us. Julian Emanuel is still with us uh, of Evercore ISI, derivatives and quantitative strategist. At what point does the rest of the world's problem become the U.S.'s problem as the dollar strengthens and the rest of the world grapples with not only the same backdrop, but also the imported inflation of a weaker currency? It, it already is, okay? The, look. We know what the inflation numbers are here, and, and frankly, we heard from corporate America uh, last week. Uh, there was one uh, very key uh, uh, pre-announcement uh, that basically the uh, recession is being imported uh, into the U.S. And so uh, from that perspective, uh, we are at that point. Uh, the thing that is different about the last several days is that clearly the Fed has been guiding the markets in terms of what it expects expects, what it wants, how it uh, wants this to unfold. Uh, but the last couple of days, again, as I uh, said earlier, uh, entering the emotional phase, we're now likely at the point where the markets are going to start guiding the central banks. And that flips the script. Uh, and that, frankly, is sort of the danger that you get into in September and October, but ultimately for us will provide at some point the buying opportunity. Julian, everyone is just so bearish this morning, huh? It's just unbelievable. I mean, my question for you is, what is the upside risk to global growth? You know, what are the markets not seeing here? Is it China reopening? Is it Russia-Ukraine de-escalation? I mean, how should investors even try to position for some of that? So that's the challenge, because the, the tail outcomes on both sides are potentially large. The expectation is that zero COVID will end sometime early in the spring next year. Um, obviously, the news coming out of Russia and Ukraine has been more favorable. Uh, we don't know what that outcome could be, but certainly the pressures are beginning to build there. As an investor, whether you do or you don't use options, you have to have an optionality mindset realizing that without notice, you could get that kind of upside. And frankly, that plays against the fact that sentiment, however you measure it, is about as pessimistic as it gets at a time of year, September and October, where you do tend to see tradable bottoms. Well, to that point, Julian, Bank of America publishing this morning saying investor sentiment is unquestionably the worst it has been since the crisis of 2008, noting that we saw inflows into cash in the week through Wednesday of $30.3 billion, people fleeing equities, running into the safety of a cash haven. Is, are we at the point where bearish is no longer actually bullish? It is just straight up bearish? 
Uh, for a time, for a time. And, and look, well, let's be frank about it. Think about it this way. There has only been one bull market in 2022, and that's the bull market for cash. <laughs> uh, so, so from that perspective, we need to see that moderate. And we would say that the initial signal, look, think about it. Uh, the Fed chair has told you that the base case is a recession. Inflation break-evens are telling you that the market doesn't actually believe in the persistence of inflation in the long run. So in that environment, you could make the argument that for us, after three years, uh, long-dated yields in the U.S. start to offer value. That's what we're going to want to see at some point. Okay, so what is that trigger point, Julia, just to sort of put a bow on all of this? When you talk about at some point there will be a buying opportunity, what is that trigger? Uh, it, 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 it's the typical. We're, we're going to need to see higher volume, uh, likely a move uh, in, the, in the VIX uh, towards 40. And then, uh, again, and you've spoken about this uh, on and off of the morning, uh, the credit market's starting to uh, internalize a bit more stress, consistent with the kind of moves that we're seeing in the dollar. Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI, thank you so much for all the time this morning. I do want to just note uh, that as we're talking, I've heard that John and Tom have actually put aside the spurs, and John's been tracking the market because, of course, uh, it is, <laughs> John, it is that Tom. kind of morning. John, not Tom. <laughs> Tom is still watching the reruns of the spurs. But uh, he put this out on Twitter with Deutsche Bank, Kaylee, basically saying the market has already repriced U.K. terminal rates above 5 percent, the highest of any other developed market country. This is perhaps why you're seeing traders price in now fully 100 100 basis points of a rate hike by the Bank of England in November. Double the move we saw them make yesterday. My question, Lisa, is say they do it. Say they move 100 basis points. What real impact does it have? Can it actually shore up support for the British pound as we see the cable rate at 110 today, not because of the monetary policy question, because of the fiscal one? Yeah, and Damien, talking about the developing market world and the idea that right now the United Kingdom is looking more like emerging markets when you take a look at the currency, when does it start to become a massive social issue? And I keep going back to this, not because of the protester and the ABBA song that unfortunately we couldn't air, but this idea of people saying something is not working for us. Well, I sure hope John's not carrying a big mortgage on the flat in Mayfair. But look, for emerging market perspective, <laughs> I think what it really comes down to is, look, you know, it's the currency. It's the currency. It's all about the dollar. You can't fight it. You can only deal with it. And look, again, if you were ahead of the curve like Brazil, you're going to weather the storm a little bit better than others. I will just tell you that it is definitely Tom buying a house in Mayfair. He might put that on John, but it was definitely be Tom right now. S&P futures lower by 1.4%. That five-year UK yield above uh, rising more than half a percentage point to 4.1%. This is Bloomberg. Perhaps we can call September the big reset as we take a look at what the implications are of a Fed policy that is poised to get more hawkish, harsher, and unavoidably inflict pain that probably will be some sort of downturn. There seemed to be a concession about that this week from Jerome Powell. Right now, we are looking for a week that's poised for more than 4% losses on the S&P. Losses deepening throughout the morning session. The Nasdaq feeling the brunt of the pain down nearly 4.5% right now for the week. How do we deal with the idea of big tech, high flyers that have brought forward the profits of years, dealing with both an economy that's deteriorating as well as valuations challenged? by a higher Fed funds rate. Really, though, we have to talk about the United Kingdom. That is where the overnight action has been. And some of these moves, as Kaylee has been mentioning all morning, have been shocking. The idea of a 50 basis point increase in five-year yields in the United Kingdom in one day. And, Damien, that really goes to this whole question of, are we looking at emerging markets-like moves? Well, I mean, look, you know, you've seen, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, the G3 is a different animal altogether. And again, if you do look at gilts, if you look at JGBs, they're not as liquid as you would otherwise think, but certainly they're behaving a lot lower, more like emerging markets. And certainly in the case of the UK, the moving gilts are, it's just quite frankly, it's unbelievable to well, me. And you're right to bring up the liquidity issue because what we've seen certainly in the two-year yields and the 10-year yields in the United States is a, an essentially a withdrawal of liquidity, right? Suddenly money 
earn something. So people can go into that and take it out of other assets. That's why you're getting an asset price deflation. The two-year yield uh, is well over 4%. The 10-year yield right now in the United States is 3.8% nearly, 3.7866, uh, just up a, a basis point. But really, we have to go back to the pound. And what happens when you get this loss of faith from foreign investors in a nation in fiscal policies that raise some questions? We're seeing the pound drop to new post-1985 lows. People now talking about what happens if you hit parity? What happens if you start to get a real withdrawal, Kaylee, of confidence as they cut taxes, the most going back to 1973, while unveiling potentially an uncapped spending plan to sort of stem some of the pain from energy prices? And the real question is, what is going to get in the way of further pound weakness? Because it doesn't seem likely that it's going to be dollar weakness. It also doesn't seem likely that it's going to be pound strength in that, yes, you have traders pricing and potentially a 100 basis point hike from the BOE in November, but hikes this far haven't been able to get the job done. And of course, it's not just the BOE that's hiking. Central banks around the world are, including the Federal Reserve, which took a decisively hawkish tilt this week in terms of where it is to where the markets are. Lara Rain, chief U.S. economist at FS Investments, is joining us now to discuss that. We've been talking all morning, morning Laura, about how it feels like things are starting to break. Is anything breaking, though, that would cause the Fed to have a change of heart? You know, I don't think so. And more importantly, I think the Fed's, um, you know, new dot plot, keeping one rate hike penciled in for next year is a critical signal because back in July, we saw markets really quick to price in the probability of rate cuts. So I think step one for the Fed is indicating that, listen, we do not have the wiggle room to pivot like we did in 2018. And number two is that this is just a completely different macro backdrop. So at the end of the day, I think my concern is that the Fed is imposing labor market models on this economy that they built during the 90s when we had a lot more labor supply. Nowadays, uh, breaking the labor market or trying to see a really significant shift and decline in jobs and impacting the economy that way may take a lot more rate hikes. A lot more rate hikes than is currently priced in. I mean, what realistically do you think we're talking about, Lara? You know, I think I, I'm still in the camp that they go to around four and a half and hold. I think there's recognition that their rate hikes take a delayed impact on the economy. And I do think that once they see inflation making some deceleration, again, there's an important difference between inflation coming down from current levels and returning to 2%. But I think some deceleration along with the pain that we've seen in financial markets may well cause them to hold. What they are pushing against is this idea that they are there's going to be room for the, you know, quote unquote Fed put or for the for Powell to pivot like he did in 2018. So I'm still in the camp where they raise to where they've said right now, but they kind of hold for most of next year and allow time for their rate hikes to have impact on the economy. Lara, we've heard this concept of peak Fed hawkishness over and over and over again. And for me, you know, I just don't know what that means. I mean, does that mean a deceleration in the pace of rate hikes from, say, 75 to 50? I mean, what does that mean in your view? You know, I think to me, peak Fed hawkishness means the ultimate sort of final destination of this rate hike cycle. And we've kept revising that up. And I think, you know, the uncertainty is something that is just continues to weigh on markets. And, you know, you still, I think there's a risk they overshoot. The fact that they were so far behind the ball on inflation this cycle has greatly increased the probability that there is some kind of overshoot, that they do overcorrect for that. There's no doubt that that risk is very prevalent and is one of the reasons that it is weighing so much on financial markets, that we haven't gotten to peak Fed hawkishness yet. Lara, in the past, you've also mentioned that, you know, a, a, a soft landing for the economy may mean a hard landing for corporate America. I wonder if you could expand on that for me. Yeah. You know, the margins that corporate America has continued to push through really speak to the fact that inflation uh, has allowed them to pass those price increases on. You know, the increase in commodity prices and input costs and wages have really allowed them comfort, um, comfortable margins. And I think going forward, if we truly expect inflation to come down, if you believe in a more soft landing scenario, it's got to mean significant margin compression for companies. And I think that is the 
sort of uh, devil's choice that we're having to make here. If companies are going to maintain the margins, you are going to continue to get persistent inflation. So that is, I think, what really we're seeing kind of this tug and pull right now. I do think inflation is going to come down. I think maintaining those margins is going to be easier in some markets than others. But I just think that we're having to not only continue to price multiples down, but to now correct earnings for the fact that margins are going to have to come under pressure as inflation corrects lower. If you believe in a soft landing scenario, Lara, do you believe in a soft landing scenario? There was an element of skepticism there. Yeah, you you picked up on it, Lisa. <laughs> it was subtle. I, it was super subtle. <laughs> reading between the lines. I think I look at the Fed's economic projections. They seem almost fantastical to me. I mean, the probability of some kind of recession has really increased in 2023. Um, my timing has always been on the second half of 2023. Um, you know, the reality is there isn't a lot of excess demand out there to destroy right now. Inflation, higher food costs, higher fuel costs are doing a good job of that with or without Fed rate hikes. So at the end of the day, growth is already weak. And that is the situation where the Fed is tightening into. I think we could definitely face a more classic recession, not just two down quarters of negative GDP growth. There's an issue also of what comes next. And we've been talking about it on the program. John's raised this uh, for months now. Are we heading back to a low growth, low yield, low inflation kind of environment post whatever downturn we can expect in the next 24 months? Do you believe that we are going to revert back to some normal that became normal over the past two decades? Or is inflation just generally and structurally going to be higher? You know, I am a believer that we have seen the end of this m great moderation period where we can just rely and kind of get complacent about inflation staying at 2% for 25 years. Um, I think deglobalization plays a huge part in that. And frankly, quantitative tightening right now is a huge fly in the ointment for the volatility that we're seeing just echoing around markets. So I think on a long-term basis, it's a more volatile world. And it's kind of the opposite of what we had over the last 15 years where traditional assets just seamlessly melted up. I think we're now in a world where persistently higher inflation is going to mean the need to focus on real assets, alternatives, and other kinds of investments. You can't just sort of chuck it into the, to the big indices anymore. Laura Rehm of FS Investments, thank you so much uh, for being with us on a day of pervading gloom and continuing gloom. Damien, uh, the withdrawal of liquidity, this is something that you were talking about, the potential for market dysfunction coming from less, liquidi less liquidity from central banks. Every Thursday afternoon at 4.30 p.m., I take a look at the Fed's balance sheet say what you will about my social life, but <laughs> it actually did go down in this past week. It hadn't been, right? It is starting to now. What's the ramification of that? Does it going to have an outsized effect that people perhaps are now just waking up to? Absolutely will. I mean, look, you know, when you add one dollar, uh, uh, the credit markets will, will will leverage that up to five, right? And on the way back, it's the exact opposite effect, right? So for every five, they're pulling. For every one, they're pulling out. The impact is fivefold. So you know, I do believe the markets are really not prepared for what could come here as the Fed really begins to scale back the size of its balance sheet. And it's not just the Fed, Lisa. It's other central banks. You know, it's it's the. PBOC, it's the BOJ. So, you know, that uh, that, that that free lunch, so to speak, is always, it okay. seems like a distant memory. I have to say, my contrarian in me, the more that people talk gloomily, the doom queen or whatever, I'm actually starting to it's wonder. It's okay, in John's chair. I, I mean, clearly, like, are we get, <laughs> kind of reaching the end of this sort of gloom and doom if everyone's feeling it right now? I mean, Damien, why is that not a good counter indicator? That, that basically people are all flooding into cash shoving it under the mattresses, canceling vacations. Why isn't that enough? Lisa, there's a lot of risk premium out there now. Valuations have corrected quite considerably. So you're absolutely right to be looking at, you know, some of the higher quality asset classes, some of those that might maintain, you know, maintain their valuations amid the volatility of the of, of the moment, so to speak. And so, look, I'm not going to start, you know, pontificating, but there are plenty of strategies, relative value, directional, and the otherwise, that have made money for investors this year, despite what you're seeing on the screens. Damien, we all pontificate. That's basically... How we how we operate in this morning. So, Kaylee, on this Pontification Friday, I, I wonder, you know, that you, how many people are you hearing say it is time for stock picking? And we hear that yeah. every year, right? But this time, people are saying is different. 
well, this time is different in a lot of ways, right, Lisa? Because we are looking at a tightening cycle unlike one we've really ever seen coming out of a recession and recovery unlike one we've ever seen. I just wonder, we've been asking for so long, is this it? Have we seen capitulation? Are we capitulating? Is it done? I just wonder if capitulation now doesn't actually mean the worst is over. It just means that investors have woken up to the fact that things are bad. <laughs> Man, this is just <laughs> one optimistic moment after another. Futures down 1.3%, 37.22. Yields higher. You know the story. It's a gloomy morning. This is Bloomberg. Makes you want to say happy Friday. Yeah, keeping, up, keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng, has outlined the most radical package of tax cuts since 1972. Both households and companies will get their taxes reduced in an attempt to boost the long-term potential of the economy. Kwarteng also cut the stamp on property purchases, and he's doing away with the cap on bankers' bonuses. Japan is moving to revive its tourist industry in the wake of the pandemic. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says a slew of border controls for COVID will be abolished next month. Individual visitors will be allowed to enter and Japan will reinstate visa waivers. The cap on daily arrivals also will be ended. Some of Wall Street's biggest banks see oil rebounding in the fourth quarter. JP Morgan Chase is forecasting Brent crude at $101 a barrel the final three months of the year. Goldman Sachs is targeting 125. Brent is trading around $90 today. Analysts say low inventories and sustained demand will keep prices elevated despite concerns of a global slowdown. Bank of America strategists say cash is king as investor sentiment hits the worst since the 2008 global financial crisis. The firm points to data that shows cash had inflows of $30.3 of $30 billion, while global equity funds saw outflows of $7.8 billion in the week through September 21st. Bond funds lost nearly $7 billion, while $400 million left gold. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I do think we are in what people refer to as a reverse currency war, but the reason for that is, of course, because every central bank is competing with every other to bring inflation down quickly, and that's still the central message. In the end, it seems like the only currency that will sustainably win this currency war is the dollar. That's certainly the story of the morning. Ibrahim Rabari, a global head of FX anal analysis at Citi. What did uh, Derek Marr say of HSBC, Kaylee? How do you fight a reverse currency war? You can't, and that's what we're seeing this morning. That's the line of the morning. It's the line of the year so far when everything is just about dollar strength and weakness of other currencies, and you are definitely seeing that in the cable rate this morning. 110, as we have some fiscal policies in the U.K. that the market clearly is not taking kindly to. Yeah, and you're seeing that in the euro as well, a 97 handle. We just uh, crossed through parity, and right now we're looking uh, at 97.45 on that currency pair. Right now, futures uh, lower 1.3 percent for the S&P, and Brent crude is really catching my eye, as well as copper. Uh, Brent crude down 3 percent to $87.64 sense. How much will the reduction in activity reduce the demand for commodities? Right now, we're looking at someone who has reset their expectations along with the rest of Wall Street this week, although it's not perhaps because of the Fed so clearly. Stephen Englander, global head of G10 FX Research at Standard Chartered Bank, joining myself, Kaylee Lyons, and Damian Sassauer this morning. I am wondering, Steve, what caused you to reset and raise up your expectations of a Fed funds rate? Well, look, we, we still expect the, the Fed to moderate the pace of hikes once it becomes clear that the labor market is beginning to topple over and that the economy is clearly under pressure. We had expected that to happen um, around this time by now, and it hasn't happened. Um, so we're stepping back. We think it's possible that one of the side effects of lower oil prices is paradoxically that by putting more money in people's wallets, it's supporting non-oil consumption and then kind of boosting demand for you know core cpi type of products and preventing those from coming down so there's kind of looks to be kind of a trade-off between headline inflation and core inflation with one you know going close to zero but the other one staying elevated 
in in that world, the, the Fed is just going to keep on hiking, you know, and, and yeah. we just had to about to that reality. Well, it seems like we're all on board now with how much the Fed is going to hike, and we have an idea of maybe a better one of what terminal is ultimately going to be. You're at 4.5%, like many others, yet you still think they're going to start cutting by the end of next year, by 25 basis points. That's not the message we got from the dot plot or the chairman. Why do you think that? I, I think once the unemployment rate starts going up, the idea that, you know, you control the unemployment rate like you control the, you know, the flame underneath your omelet while you're cooking it, I think, is uh, uh, hopeful, to say the least. And um, we, we think that given the, the pace of hikes, that once it becomes clear that they've hiked enough to get unemployment going, um, they'll say, look, we, we, we don't have to go that much further. So we're, we're, you know, and then at some point they sort of say, well, we're clearly well above neutral. We don't have to be that far above neutral. We, you know, we can be a little bit you know, less above, you know, above neutral. But we, you know, it doesn't mean dovish because it's still, you know, basically our Q4 to, you know, Q4 forecast is, it doesn't change all that much. It just means that they, um, you know, they're hawkish and they're modulating their hawkishness according to the circumstances. Steve, my colleagues at Bloomberg Economics placed the probability of a recession over the next 12 months of roughly 54%. Do you think the Fed can actually engineer a soft landing or is that ship sailed? You know, I, I think a soft landing is um, it, it's something that you want. It's, it's, you know, it's not something that you would ever count on as a central banker. I, I think that, um, you know, it's a way of making the, the hawkishness and the tightness more palatable. But, you know, uh, it's, it's like discussions we had about escape velocity a couple of years ago and so on. It's, it's just like so hard to grasp that I think that the uh, risk is that if you get, you know, you have to slow the economy enough to get inflation down. The odds are heavily, if you're doing that, you're going to have a recession. You know, a few months back, Steve, if you recall, uh, we were speaking at the Harvard Club to a bunch of China watchers. And so my <laughs> Wait, question- what, what was that, Damien? Can you just do that I'm one I'm sorry, the, the Harvard Club? Sorry, here in New York. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, so we were talking to a bunch of China watchers. We were talking about uh, uh, China-US yield divergence. We were talking about dollar yuan, and we were talking about the PBOC's reluctance to cut rates because of capital outflows. I wonder, can you just share your thoughts on that? I mean, do you see the PBOC continuing to cut rates in the face of what's going on here? You know, it, look, it, it, when you make the case for sort of having some restrictions on capital mobility, I think being able to run your domestic economy somewhat independently of the rest of the world is, is the most powerful uh, element of this, assuming you're, you're running, you know, the correct policy. So I think that the... Um, you know, given that the economy is soft and, and has surprised on the downside, it looks like they're going to continue to maintain, um, you know, kind of easy money. I, I don't think that they're going to, um, you know, be super soft, but I think the bias still is towards easy money there, um, you know, and, and, and yeah. Stephen, before we let you go, I just have really a simple question for you. Would you buy the pound today? Um, no. <laughs> you know, okay. Why not? I yeah, mean, basically, I'm how much done. further does it have to go? Well, you know, they're really rolling the dice on this. I mean, this this will be the greatest experiment ever run if, if it succeeds in stimulating the, the UK economy. But I, I think there's a real question mark about applying a lot of fiscal to an economy which is facing a lot of supply constraints. We, you know, US tried that in 2021 and we, we saw what happened. And, you know, I think the market is, you know, watching the, the budget and, and just kind of digesting this. Um, the most, I'd say the, the range of views is um, dire to, you know, cross your fingers and, and light some candles. Make it, you know, if it works, it's, it's great. But I don't think anyone really has confidence that this is a policy that's going to, to really get growth going again. Okay, so and, Stephen... And it, it's showing up as a weak pound. We just have about 30 seconds, but if lighting candles doesn't work and, and saying a prayer, where are we headed for the pound dollar cross? Uh, we'll have to see. I mean, you know, the, look, the, um, there's the Bank of England and, you know, the market's marking up what the BOE is doing. I, I think it's going to be very delicate because raising rates um, harshly in this environment could lead to even more pressure on the currency if the market just sees these things are incompatible. It's a, it's a very tough situation. 
Steve Englander of Standard Chartered Bank, thank you so much for being with us. And Damien, this kind of goes to what you were saying at the start of the show, which is intervention. It seems inevitable. What form does it take when it comes to the pound? What form does it take when it comes to the euro? We are seeing what form it takes, perhaps, with the Japanese yen, but that's kind of, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, no, I, you know, I really don't know the answer to that, Lisa. I mean, look, you know, you would think that yield differentials have something to do with it, but we've heard from a lot of our guests today that, you know, carries out the door. So, you know, to me, it's going to be something along the lines of plumbing. It's going to be about balance sheet reduction. It's going to be about the pace of that. I think that's really what the focus is going to have to be. And honestly, Kaylee, the scope of the moves, just you've been watching them and you've been saying, and you're right to say this, you keep wondering, are you looking at the wrong thing? Right. Is this really intraday or is this perhaps a weekly move? I mean, how often do we see a 50 basis point move on a gilt yield? on the day. That is what we are seeing on the five year on this Friday. It is just absolutely astounding. 4.128% on the five year yield in the United Kingdom. S&P features lower by one and a quarter percent. Uh, and really Brent crude and, and copper, I should say as well. The commodity sector really selling off in the face of potentially reduced demand. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. We're dealing with an uphill battle here with what's going on with the dollar globally. We simply aren't in normal times. We are drifting towards global recession and we are in global bear market. The tightness of the labor market is a real issue. In the background, corporate balance sheets remain very healthy. The economy will slow, earnings growth will slow, but I think it's possible that we could see higher equity prices. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Perhaps September will be the great reset on a messy morning morning after a messy week. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Tom and John are both out today and, and we're very lucky. Kaylee Lyons and Damian Sassow are both very much in. And it has been an incredible week of resetting expectations for both Fed funds rate and how difficult it will be, Kaylee, to bring inflation down. It's a question of is there a good scenario to look at here? I was speaking with Max Kettner of HSBC earlier this morning and he said it's kind of a tails you win, heads I lose scenario. Because on the one hand, you can say the data is going to hold up. That just means central banks have to be more aggressive and that's going to be bad for a lot of assets. On the other hand, if the data starts to deteriorate and growth goes down, that also is a difficult scenario for a lot of assets. And that's why you're seeing reflected wherever you look a lot of pain and a lot of red on the screen this morning. And Damien, the big question of the week has been what has to break before the Fed starts to take notice. And it hasn't been in the currency market, even as we see things completely unravel at paces that really do kind of represent what you've been tracking in the developing world over the past couple decades. Yeah, it's unemployment, it's credit spreads. I mean, those, those are the items that you probably need to look at for any sort of signal whether or not the Fed's going to start easing off on its hiking campaign. But look, I mean, the verdict is still out. And yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's a painful morning for, for most. Well, a lot of people are talking about why credit is held in so well, and we'll continue to talk about that throughout the weeks to come. But Damien, you raised something, and I want to just harp on it for a moment. This question about are things trading with ease? And recently, they had been doing uh, pretty well. And you're saying that there are signs that perhaps we're not seeing the real-time pricing that really reflects how people are evaluating and reevaluating their positioning. Well, I mean, certainly we're not going to see what general collateral in the Treasury markets priced at after yesterday's move. I mean, I'm curious to see where some of those spreads are. And so, look, I mean, you know, we need to wait a few days. We need to kind of soak it all in and see where we are. But you're absolutely right. I mean, liquidity is everything. It doesn't take a whole hell of a lot to move markets when, when, when they're not really trading very liquidly. So, you know, I think, you know, the real, for me, it's going to be really credit. It's going to be how is high yield trading, how are leveraged loans trading, how are spreads trading. And a lot of the equity traders are saying, and even the, the bond and the, the uh, currency traders are saying, Kaylee, that they're looking at earnings and they yeah. really want to understand how much companies are lowering their margin expectations. We were just speaking about that uh, a moment ago with Laura Rehm about how that's going to have to happen at some point, to what extent and what the guidance is in terms of their pricing power, yeah. their growth power and potential layoffs. Exactly. And when we have the likes of FedEx reporting yesterday talking about how not only do they want to just cut costs by reducing things like flights, they also want to raise their prices on certain freight. How are you going to do that if you're also talking an environment in which demand is deteriorating? It is the pricing power question that ultimately, as Julian Emanuel was telling us earlier, is going to be what impacts corporate margins. It is something that Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley has been warning about for some time that, yes, we have started to see those downward earnings revisions, but not to the extent that he 
he thinks we're ultimately going to need to. We asked Stephen Englander a really simple question as we talk about pain, as we talk about some of these moves. Would you buy the pound? No, he said. <laughs> and right now we're seeing the pound at 110 uh, versus the dollar. Where does it stop, right? And that is one of the questions as we see pain across the board. Just want to whip through some of the action. We're seeing uh, S&P futures decline 1.2%. The NASDAQ down 1.3%. Those five-year gilt yields. Honestly, just shocking. It is unreal. Continue to rise. Now, 4.1% up 54 basis points on the day. I mean, Kaylee, this is something you've been talking about. The pace of move is what really is notable. It's notable and it's mildly alarming. And yet the UK government, the new government, doesn't necessarily seem to mind. When the Chancellor of the Exchequer was asked in Parliament about the moves we're seeing today, his answer was the markets will do what the markets do. So it seems like they are going to be pushing forward with this fiscal policy that clearly the bond market and the currency market does not like. Traders now pricing in 100 basis point, a rate hike by the Bank of England, because that will be the response. That will be what they do potentially to try to stave some of the pain as experienced in the pound. And we're looking at Brent crude lower by three. 3%, $87.80 as people reconsider how much activity really has to decline. Joining us now, Dan Suzuki, always a brilliant mind, deputy CIO at Richard Bernstein Advisors, who has been ahead of the game for a long time, being highly bearish, seeing really no upside. Right now, the world is coming to your view. Are you starting to be a little bit more positive, or do you feel even worse? <laughs> Uh, well, good morning, Lisa. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any real reason to sort of change the view. I mean, we're happy to be cautious here. I think right now, I mean, what we've been saying is that there's only two certainties for the foreseeable future. It's that profits growth is going to continue to slow and probably surprise the downside relative to people's still pretty, you know, elevated expectations, and liquidity is going to continue to tighten. And that's the worst possible combination for markets. So unless you see signs that either of those things is reversing course, or at least stabilizing, it's hard to get really bullish here. Do you think, Dan, that the market has now proper, properly, appropriately priced the Fed? And if we have done that, is the next thing going to be properly a pro, a, a pricing in the corporate profit downturn you think we'll see? And what does that look like? Yeah, Kaylee, I think that's a, that's a very good summation of, of my view. I think um, right now, um, you know, the market for, for most of this year, people were very skeptical, skeptical about inflation initially, and then they were skeptical about the Fed's reaction to inflation. Now people have come around to believing the Fed. So I, I do believe a lot of that's priced in. So as you price in the next stage of this cycle, which is that slowing growth environment you mentioned, I think that's going to have a very different impact on on rates, particularly on the longer end of rates. So I think, you know, this one of the big transitions we're, we're probably going to be you know, faced with in the next month or so, or even in the next coming months, is that shift of, you know, a tighter Fed up until now meant higher longer term rates. You know, perhaps, you know, a tighter Fed going forward is going to actually mean lower rates because it means lower long term growth, lower long term inflation. Dan, you've often highlighted the difference between an economic recession and a profit recession. I'm wondering, you know, what sectors offer protection from a profit recession? Are we talking consumer staples, healthcare, utilities? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, what we tell people is that the cycle is driven by cyclicals. And so, you know, the stuff that's going to hold up better when, when growth is slowing is, is are those stable earnings growth sectors, such as everything you mentioned, you know, staples, utilities, healthcare, they're just less economic sensitive. You're going to still go out there and buy toothpaste and you're still going to go out there and buy your meds. And that's why their earnings are going to hold up on a relative basis much better. Now, it, depending on how bad the slowdown gets, you can still see, you know, uh, negative growth rates for, and negative, you know, price performance. You know, but it's a rel relative game in that type of environment. I love it. Invest in toothpaste and toilet paper. That seems to be the <laughs> trade. The other trade Hygiene. is, yeah, exactly. Uh, perhaps people will continue with that, hopefully. Uh, there, <laughs> the other issue, as uh, Evercore ISI, as Julian Emanuel was saying, there has been only one bull market in 2022, and that's the bull market for cash. How much are you invested still in cash or cash-like instruments as real yields continue to climb? Yeah, I think this is a great point. I mean, right now we have probably one of the highest, you know, exposures to cash and cash-like investments that we've had in in the history of the firm. So I think that you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said for the the safety, the income, and being able to capitalize on this you know higher rising short rate environment that we're in the midst of. 
Um, but we're at, right now, as I mentioned, we're kind of a barbell between you know that cash position, which is very high, and you know exposure to long-term treasuries, which is if we're, if we're right about the growth outlook and we're right about how the market's going to have to interpret that growth outlook, you know you could actually see meaningful upside uh, in these areas that have gotten crushed this year. Uh, particularly the long end of the curve. Can you give us a sense, Dan, of what that means in terms of the biggest cash allocation in the history of your fund and, and sort of the progression over 2022 in terms of how you've built that holding? Yeah, um, you know, we've held a, a decent cash, posi uh, ca cash position for a while in terms of cash-like investments, but it's certainly increased over the last, you know, three to six months. You know, right now, you know, of our multi-asset flagship portfolio, you know, it's approaching 20%. You know, it's probably about 17% or so of the portfolio is in cash and cash-like investments. And I think, you know, it, it's a lot, but it gives you a lot of dry powder. It gives you a lot of safety. And again, you also get to capitalize on these higher rates uh, that the Fed is providing us. Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein Advisors, thank you. Uh, that's fascinating perspective at a time when you're not alone. A lot of people are going into cash in the past week. Just Bank of America, Merrill Lynch put out, Global Research put out uh, some flows data this morning that showed, Kaylee, that basically the only thing that got flows was cash and everything else got outflows, including from government bonds, including from credit, including from gold. Yeah, bond funds lost $6.9 billion. Equity funds saw outflows of $7.8 billion. The inflows into cash to the tune of $30.3 billion in the week through Wednesday. Bank of America saying that this shows that investor sentiment is unquestionably the worst it has been since the crisis of 2008. Clearly, everybody is feeling bearish. At what point does it become a narrative no longer that everything is so bearish that it actually is bullish and this is actually just bearish? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. And how much does this have to do with real yields? And Damien, I'm looking right now at real yields on the 10-year Treasury. That's basically adjusted for inflation expectations over the next 10 years. And you can get into an argument about whether they're accurately pricing in what's going to come, et cetera, et cetera. However, in this construct, we're seeing real yields of 1.37%. That's the highest, I believe, yeah. going back uh, at one point to 2011, and then potentially at this point, actually almost 2010, and really bumping up against this point where you're getting paid for the first time to not really take risk. That's right. Rising real yields is negative for risk assets. You know, I mean, so you get paid finally. You're absolutely right, Lisa. I mean, you know, I just have to point this out. You know, I've gotten a lot of emails this morning comparing sterling to the Turkish lira. Now, that's not a good comparison to be making considering the Central Bank of Turkey actually cut rates by 100 bips yeah. last week. <laughs> I was about to say, they were the one, uh, you know, it was Central Bank that just seems to defy, you know, economic logic. Some people arguing that perhaps there's something similar. I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but that some of the plans yes, might are. defy economic logic in the United Kingdom. Futures lower by 1.2%, and you're looking at a pound at 110.60. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Liz Truss's government has come out with the most radical set of tax cuts since 1972. Both workers and companies will see their taxes reduced. The basic tax rate will be cut and the top rate, the richest earners pay, will be abolished. From April the 23rd, we will have a, high, a single higher rate of income tax of 40%. We will cut the basic rate of income tax to 19 pence in April 2023, one year early. That means a tax cut for over 31 million people in just a few months' time. Quarting also eased the stamp duty on home purchases. That's likely to help home builders and 200,000 buyers a year. And he lifted the cap on bankers' bonuses. In Ukraine, voting starts today in four Russian-occupied territories on whether to join Russia. Ukraine and its allies have blasted the votes as shams. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said, quote, we will not allow President Putin to get away with it. Japan is moving to revive its tourist industry in the wake of the pandemic. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says a slew of COVID border controls will be abolished next month. Individual visitors will be allowed to enter and Japan will reinstate visa waivers. The cap on daily arrivals will also be ended. Hong Kong is making its biggest move yet in the push to end its pandemic isolation. The city is scrapping hotel quarantine for inbound travelers starting next week. In the three days after they get to Hong Kong, travelers will still face restrictions on their movements. Among them, no going to bars and eating at restaurants. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
The Fed basically wants to wrap up or get very close to the end of the cycle by, the, by this year. So they're massively front loading. After years of telling us to dismiss the dots, they're using it as forward guidance. They have two meetings to turn around, but that's not enough time. They're going to have to go to 4% and wait till something breaks. And is something breaking right now? That is increasingly going to be the question today and perhaps in the weeks to come. George Concalves there, head of U.S. macro strategy at MUFG. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Tom Keene and Jonathan Farrow off today on a well-deserved day off and we have luckily with us Kaylee Lines and Damian Sassauer very much in focus with markets absolutely as one put person put it in the market in free fall the Fed got what they wanted markets in free fall that's from Andrew Brenner over at Nat Alliance Securities we're looking right now at the S&P not really necessarily the free fall down 1.2 percent but certainly the pound in free fall down at one point as much as 2 percent 110 Brent crude very much also getting focus which I find interesting down 3 percent to 80 7771 even though and this is something that I've been noticing you're seeing a complete reset when it comes to Wall Street projections for the S&P when it comes to Wall Street projections for Fed funds rate but there's a doubling down on oil prices that they are going to go higher later into this deal Julian Lee Bloomberg oil strategist joining us now Julian what do you make of that that people are not capitulating to this idea that the lack of demand induced by a recession is truly going to cause protracted lower uh, oil prices I, I think the, the banks are looking very much at the, the physical supply demand balances and they are seeing uh, what is essentially a tight physical market. Um, the, the, the view is that Chinese demand will come back at some point uh, and when it does, there isn't uh, the spare capacity uh, to boost output to meet that growth in demand. Inventories are already low. Uh, they were drawn down very, very heavily uh, last year, and they really, you know, they, they would continue to be drawn down less heavily, but still drawn in the first quarter of this year. There have been some small builds perhaps over the second and third quarters, um, but that's, you know, that's done little more than, than keep things stable. Um, and so it's this, this market tightness, which mm. a, a lot of people think isn't being reflected in uh, these headline uh, futures market prices. I mean, we've had um, the Saudi oil minister saying this. We, we've had a number of other people who are saying that, the, that really the market has become disconnected. And what the banks, I think, are looking at are, are the physical signals and they're worried about shortage next quarter and into 2023. Julian, you talk about the recovery in China demand. To what extent would that offset a softening of demand elsewhere in places like Europe or even ultimately the U.S., where Jerome Powell basically said in not so many words that a recession is indeed likely? Does demand destruction in those economies get outbalanced by a recovery in China? Well, I think this is what some people are, are clearly building into their forecasts. I'm, I'm a little skeptical. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you know, we've, we've seen no signs yet of, of China uh, easing up on its COVID policy and, and really opening up. We're still seeing uh, rolling lockdowns of, of cities in China. Um, and the other thing that, that I think people need to start looking at is how China is, is so connected to the rest of the world. If we get uh, recession, which seems almost inevitable, and we, we get significant slowdown in consumer spending, uh, that's going to have a hit on Chinese exports um, and therefore on Chinese manufacturing. Um, and that, I think, then starts to raise questions about um, how much of a rebound can we really expect to see in China if every, everywhere else in the world is slowing down. Julian, OPEC publishes its world oil outlook on Tuesday. And, you know, many believe that OPEC Plus will actually cut production if oil prices continue to decline. I mean, do you really see potential for continued production cuts? Um, I think they are very focused on the price at the moment. I, I think that um, they are pushing this narrative um, that, that, that the market is, is disconnected and uh, that somehow they have to get a better reflection of, of tight uh, physical markets into uh, the, the futures prices. But it seems very odd to me that if you're arguing 
uh, that the physical market is very tight, your response to that is to take physical supplies out of the market. That just seems nonsensical to me um, if you want a balanced market. And I, I think that's a, you know, that's a big if when it comes to OPEC plus. I think what they want is uh, is higher prices at the moment. I mean, they're, they're uncomfortable with Brent um, at or below $90 a barrel, I, I think. Um, but the one thing I would say is that they are falling so far short of uh, their output targets at the moment that even if they were to cut targets by a million barrels a day, and there's no suggestion uh, that they're looking at anything like that, but even if they were, and to uh, distribute that among uh, the group's membership in, in the same proportions that they have uh, been doing so far, most of them wouldn't have to make any physical cut at all because they're so far adrift of, of those targets anyway. Just real quick, Julian, you're talking about the physical versus the virtual market or the paper market uh, as traded in contracts. I'm looking at the physical market for gasoline prices in the United States, which we've been tracking uh, for the past three months stopped dropping. They had dropped for about 90 days straight, and now they're starting to climb a little bit. How much is that going to really have a ramification? How much do you see that kind of creeping up in real physical markets that people use every day? Um, I, I think we are certainly uh, perhaps for, for a, a little while out of um, this, this period of, of falling uh, consumer prices. Uh, certainly, if you look around Europe, we here have uh, the problem of, of a, a very strong dollar, uh, that we are uh, importing oil and, and the oil that we're trading is priced in dollars. If you start converting that into uh, euros or into sterling here in the UK, um, the, 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 the stronger dollar is making that more expensive uh, for European and, and British customers. Uh, we haven't yet really seen that coming through into the pumps in, in Britain, but we may well do yeah. uh, that these falling prices that we've seen start to reverse. Julian Lee, thank you so much for taking the time. Right now we are watching markets very much having a difficult morning, although the S&P retracing some of the losses from earlier down 1.2%. Damien, on a day like today, what do you watch? How do you gauge how much to actually play into the fear versus to pull back, reset, and say, wait a second, usually when there's blood, it usually is an opportunity. Well, I think you have to look at sentiment indicators, right? And there's no sentiment indicator that I like more than put call option skew, right? So if you look at dollar yen, you look at uh, pound dollar, and you look at some of the put call uh, 25 delta risk reversals and things of that nature, you might get a sense of, you know, the cost for hedge protection in this market. And that might give you some semblance of where you want to be positioning. Talking about hedging, the VIX, really not at 40. It's at 28.72, not necessarily screaming fear in the same way that it has traditionally. Coming up, Jan Eberly, professor of finance at the Kellogg School of Management. We'll get a view, big picture of how we can understand the economy, how much we've seen a real sea change this week. From New York, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Radio. John Farrow, Tom Keane, both out today. Kaylee Lines and Damian Sassauer in as we look at markets and turmoil, not only uh, in stocks, but even more so in the FX space. That is where the activity is stemming from the United Kingdom's proposals. Liz Truss's administration coming out, cutting taxes by the most since 1973, even as they pledged to borrow uh, quite a bit of money to spend in order to stave off some of the energy costs for households. We're looking now to pound at 110 handle, down nearly 2%, just plummeting to the lowest since 1985. We're looking at five-year yields in the United Kingdom, surging by more than half a percentage point to 4%. And S&P futures down by about 1.2%. Looking at the front end, Kaylee, this has just got my attention all week long and all month long. Just the pace of the increase, we're now looking at nearly a 4.2% two-year yield, having risen from 1.6% at the beginning of the year. I mean, just well, a shocking pace here. 
I mean, even just since the start of the month of September, which isn't even over yet, it's been a 100 basis point move. It has been absolutely remarkable, not just in the Treasury market at the front end, but really the movement we are seeing in sovereign bonds throughout the world. What you're not really seeing yet, Lisa, is the ripple effect in credit. You aren't seeing as much bleeding there as maybe you might expect. And as we have a conversation this morning about it looks like things are breaking, it doesn't look like that in credit. And if that doesn't break, does it matter at all to the Fed? And that's a great question, and that's something that people have been answering. Maybe not. And Damian, we're looking right now, and just to reset, two-year yields started the year, January, at 0.76%. They are currently at 4.2%. Is there an analog to this, maybe even not in the developed world, but in the emerging market complex, in terms of what this does to the entire investment thesis? Well, let's just look at the entire universe of benchmark-eligible uh, debt, really. I mean, credit, treasury you name it, securitized assets and so forth. I mean, that uh, that $62 billion beast has lost $4.5 billion since July. $4.5 billion in market value. That's the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index. That's the market value that's been lost on this move in yields. And look, you talk about credit, high yields only down 12%, 13% year-to-date, Lisa. That's a scorcher compared to what we've seen in treasuries, which are down more than 20% on the year. That's the market. And then, of course, there's the economy. And it's sort of this really perverse incentive that almost the faster that the economy deteriorates, the more quickly the Fed can pivot. And people are concerned that the market, that the economy, or not the market, the economy is not deteriorating quickly enough. It is highly uncomfortable for economists to be looking at that, including Janice Eberly, who has incredible an extensive experience in administrations as a chief economist to the White House from 2011 to 2013. She is currently senior associate dean and professor of finance at the Kellogg School of Management, and she joins us now. Jen Eberly, thank you so much for being here. When you take a look at this backdrop in markets, what is your fear for how this translates to the economy? Good morning, Lisa. It's great to be with you. Um, you're right that there's a lot of market turmoil. The, the, the Fed's initial announcement of the 75 basis points, of course, wasn't the surprise. It was the surrounding messaging that included you know, the, the Fed's not only willingness, but their expectation that rates would be above 4% by the end of the year going into 2023 and stay higher for a longer period of time than they had previously conveyed. So that clearly increases the likelihood of a downturn uh, and potentially the severity of any subsequent recession. So that's what's really created the, the volatility in the markets because it, it puts much more pressure on the supply side of the economy and, and what we might be looking for, for on, the, on, on that side, on the real side of the economy. Jan, the message from the Federal Reserve is we're not going to blink. We are going to look at the unemployment rate rising and we are going to tolerate and keep doing the job until the job is done. Do you buy that narrative or do you think unemployment may reach a level in which the Fed has no choice but to turn the other way? Well, they've been abundantly clear the the chairman said in Jackson Hole and he reiterated this uh, in, in his news conference this week that the message hasn't changed. What changed was the quantitative uh, message that came out. So it gives much less room for interpretation. And the quantitative uh, message reflects the, the message to the economy that the Fed and, and markets had had some optimism that the supply side might soften and make a dramatic aggressive move on the Fed side less necessary. But that hasn't happened so far. And so the Fed message is clear that they cannot and will not wait for the supply side to move favorably, that they're acting aggressively now. And you know that, that gives us this exposure. If the Fed's not gonna be a shock absorber, what's gonna happen on the real side in commodities, mm. in uh, energy, and in housing, for example. We'll get to housing in just a minute, but if I could just ask about the inflation target first, when the chairman says it will be enough, we are going to get inflation down to target. Is a 2% inflation target still realistic in this new world, or is the Fed going to have to change its definition of success? Well, bringing inflation down is a long process, right? So they're focused on that 2% target because that's what they committed to and that's what's in their mandate. Um, but the inflation process, which 
and, and the transmission of monetary policy through to inflation relies on a much slower cadence of uh, households pulling back on uh, auto purchases, on housing purchases, firms pulling back on investments because they're more expensive. Um, that moves in a much slower way. So, you know, they're not thinking we're going to get to 2% immediately. That, that will take time. Uh, inflation moves at a slower cadence than market reactions. Uh, Dr. Eberle, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate is now at 6.55%. That's the highest since March of 2002. I mean, housing starts picked up slightly in August, but I mean, building permits are down, you know, new pending sale, everything, you know, decelerating. Just how bad can things get in the U.S. housing market? That the housing market is uh, acting in, in, in some ways in a counterintuitive and, and counterproductive way to the inflation story. Um, rents and, and housing costs are both an important part of the inflation indices that we use, um, and they're also the biggest part of households' budgets. So people really feel those increases in costs. The, the way to bring those costs down durably is to increase the supply of available housing. So to have more construction, more building of homes and apartments uh, for, for people to, to rent and, and, and to buy. But in the increase in costs, as you noted, the higher mortgage costs, that increases the carrying costs of real estate, and it also increases the cost of building and construction. So the higher interest rates in this market can actually be counterproductive because they're reducing supply, and that puts upward pressure on prices, not downward pressure on prices, which is what we'd like to see. So it's a reminder that, you know, it, it's not an argument for lowering rates, but it's a reminder that bringing inflation down in a market like housing um, takes a lot of time for the market to, to cool off and, and normalize. And it's not just about monetary policy, which we should also remember monetary policy is really powerful, but it's not a Swiss army knife. You know, it, it's not a multi-purpose tool. And we still have to do the hard work on the real side of building homes, continuing to innovate, investing in our productive capacity so that we have a, a strong uh, economy that's set for growth going forward. We just have about a minute left, but given the, how much bond prices have gone down, how much yields have risen, how much can the United States and frankly other nations around the world really invest in the way that they maybe perhaps need to in the upcoming years, given the punitive borrowing costs? So there, there's two parts to um, the building. There's having uh, productive projects, good ideas going forward, and, and I think we have those. The other part is the financing, which can be from borrowing, but it can also be from other sources, um, including cash on hand. So, so firms are pretty well financed now, especially in the US. The rising costs around the world, you, see, you saw central banks move in concert yesterday to raise rates. Some of that is that they're facing the same inflationary pressures that we're facing in the US, but some of it also is the relative value of the dollar. Um, it's got, as you mentioned, the movements in, in currency markets. That's very difficult for many economies to, um, to, to manage and to uh, deal with because the higher value of the dollar increases the cost of their imported goods as their currency falls. It also increases the cost of their debt payments if they have dollar denominated uh, debt themselves. So that puts extra pressure uh, on them to raise rates and, and not let the U.S. get too far ahead of them. Jan Everly of the Kellogg School, thank you so much. Also formerly of the White House from 2011 to 2013 as the chief economist at uh, the, uh, the Treasury Department. Just looking right now, Damien, Paul McNamara, who I mentioned earlier, put this out just now. Emerging markets local debt is down 16.3 percent this year in U.S. dollar terms. U.K. gilts are down 37 yeah. percent. So, no, the U.K. is not behaving like an emerging market. <laughs> it's much, much worse. <laughs> well, that's just one year, Lisa. We have to look out over a longer period if you want to start making comparisons to emerging market local debt.
<laughs> All right, and we'll let you do that, Kaylee. What a market. Honestly, this has been a, a great reset ahead of what is likely to be a difficult winter. Absolutely, for Europe and for the UK. And of course, the fiscal policies that they announced today are to try to help the consumer navigate that difficult winter in part by spending a bunch to cushion the energy question. But then you have to borrow to do that because you're also cutting taxes. It is just such a difficult equation and why we are seeing a cable rate at 110. And in fairness, which consumers are you protecting if you're cutting uh, some of, of the taxes for the wealthiest individuals? Coming up on The Open, we speak with Troy Gajewski, Chief Market Strategist at FS Investments, on a day when a lot of currencies are falling out of bed, King Dollar being punitive for nations around the world. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer Kwasi Kwarteng has outlined the most radical package of tax cuts since 1972. Both households and companies will get their taxes reduced in an attempt to boost the long-term potential of the economy. Kwarteng also cut the stamp tax on property purchases and he's doing away with the cap on bankers' bonuses. In Iran, authorities threatened to prosecute anyone that engaged in what they call illegal gatherings. Following almost a week of bloody protests, they started last Friday after the death of a 22-year-old who had been detained by Iran's morality police for allegedly breaking Islamic dress codes. At least 17 people have died so far. Japan is moving to revive its tourist industry in the wake of the pandemic. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says a slew of COVID border controls will be abolished next month. Individual visitors will be allowed to enter and Japan will reinstate visa waivers. The cap on daily arrivals also will be ended. Some of Wall Street's biggest banks see oil rebounding in the fourth quarter. J.P. Morgan Chase is forecasting Brent crude at $101 a barrel the final three months of the year. Goldman Sachs is targeting 125. Brent is trading around $90 today. Analysts say low inventories and sustained demand will keep prices elevated despite concerns of a global slowdown. And Apple Music will replace Pepsi as a presenter of the Super Bowl halftime show. Pepsi has had its name on the star-studded intermission since 2013. According to Sportico, Apple may have paid as much as $50 million a year for the five-year deal. This year, more than 120 million viewers watched the halftime show. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Democracy is a, a, a constant work in progress. We're never done. It's never safe. We'll see the outcome of uh, the elections. We had just elections in Sweden too. My approach is um, that whatever democratic government is willing to work with us, we're working together. Ursula von der Leyen, European Commission president, speaking ahead of Italy, heading to the polls this weekend. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on television and radio. I'm Kaylee Lines alongside Damian Sassauer, Tom Keen, John Farrow off today. Lisa heading out to do the market open, which looks like it's going to be an ugly one here in the U.S. Futures are down 1.3 percent, but really the movement is across the Atlantic and in other asset classes, specifically the U.K. and in foreign exchange and the gilt market. The five-year gilt yield right now up 50 basis points on the day to 4.05 or 06 percent after we got some fiscal policy outlined uh, a mini budget but i don't know if it was really mini coming from the new uk government while the cable rate is at 110.76 at the moment and you're seeing your weakness really across the board including for the euro which currently is trading at 97.52 to the dollar. And something else that the euro and really markets across Europe will have to account for this weekend is that election in Italy. So we want to go now to Rome. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo is there standing by. Maria, just run us through what is at stake in this election as it looks like the far right is ultimately going to be the one to claim victory. 
Yeah, and, and, and you know, this is a story. It's a highly anticipated election. You have the political story behind this. Of course, the country is now taking uh, a turn or shifting uh, to the right. You also have the economics of the Italian uh, economy. This is a dead story. It's about debt sustainability. It always is. The BTP market will be paying close attention to that on the Monday, moving into, of course, later in the week. And then you have an election in what is one of the biggest economies in the euro area happening in the context of war. That is a war in Ukraine. There is a conversation to be had about sanctions and there is also a conversation about, well, where is the war going? Is is Italy going to continue to supply weapons to this country? And it's a funny that on a day like today you mentioned the UK and the meltdown that we're seeing there. Here, when you look at the manifesto from the Italian right, they do have a similar recipe. What they want to do is cut taxes too and they also say they want to put a ceiling on the price of energy bills. So perhaps a taste of what may be to come. The only issue that's different here, of of course, is a European money that is feeding always in exchange for reforms. Yeah, Maria, I mean, my question is, how are markets really looking at Georgia Maloney here? I mean, are they viewing her as some sort of charismatic nationalist, as a far-right radical? I mean, what's the interpretation? Is it going to be business-friendly or not, or, or not at all? Look, it's a very good question, and Giorgia Meloni has run, in fact, a very smart campaign that I would say at times is almost a bipolar uh, campaign. When you listen to her speak in Italy to the Italian public, this is a woman that we know is very fiery, a lot of commentary uh, that perhaps would not go down well in some of the most progressive democracies uh, in Europe, particularly not coming from a country like Italy, which, remember, is a founding member of the EU. It's also a member of the Euro, clearly, but also a NATO member. But when you look at the international aspect of this and this is where she's been very smart she has reassured that the Italy exit story this is dead the idea that Italy could potentially crash out of the euro she doesn't want to talk about in fact this has played no role in this campaign and when it comes to Ukraine she says nothing will change from the Draghi line so this is a campaign that runs in some ways on two different legs the real issue is once you get to government you have to decide policy and that will be the biggest test for Giorgia Meloni is this the Italian Giorgia Meloni or is this a business-friendly Milani that likes to speak to the international audience? Well, and on that international audience, Maria, talk to us about how Europe more broadly is viewing this election. We heard a very diplomatic take about recognizing the democratic process from Ursula von der Leyen, but really what is at stake for other countries in the Eurozone? Listen, I, I, I'm not sure if she was actually, in fact, being diplomatic, because the way that that comment has been perceived today in this country is that Ursula von der Leyen is getting involved in the election, and she should mm -hmm. not be doing that as a head of the commission right before a vote when polls are active. Uh, by the way, if anything, this is a gift to the campaign of Meloni, again, arguing it's the Italians that vote and who should really decide the direction of the country. It is not Brussels. So I'm not sure that comment here, in fact, uh, has gone well, but we'll have to wait and see, of course, for Monday for that reaction, but the European Union is a country, well, it's a continent of 27 different member states, very different political systems, but they have to find a way to work together, particularly where there's billions of euros at stake. All right, Maria Tadea, looking forward to your election coverage throughout the weekend as Italy heads to the polls on Sunday. Damien, I know you wanted to throw a, a football soccer question to Maria. I did. I did. I wanted to ask her the correct pronunciation of Bluga. I think it's Bluga, <laughs> right? Club Bluga? <laughs> I'm Belgian sure Maria team. has has thoughts on, on the Champions League and how to pronounce all of those teams, but we'll let her get back to work covering Italy. I mean, Damien, talk about the number of curveballs Europe has been thrown over the last six to nine months. It is just a very difficult picture. You have political risk in Italy. You have an energy crisis that you have to deal with, and you have an ongoing war in the eastern part of, of the Eurozone. It's a very difficult picture, and of course that extends as well to the UK, and you were seeing that evident today in the price action. Yeah, but what's interesting, I think, is also is that bond yields aren't reacting nearly as much as the gilts have, right? I mean, that has to do with something, the level of yields are lower in Europe, but nevertheless, you know, they seem to be a little bit more contained relative to their peers, uh, you, know, you know, in England. And so, you know, for me, you know, how much spillover, how much contagion are we really going to see? And certainly, as you look at Italy and you look at BTB spreads after this weekend, I wonder what the, you know, knock-on effect there is going to be as well. And for the currencies, too, we have to keep in mind because that is where so much of the action has been centered. John Farrow never really takes a day off. He's out tweeting research from SockGen. This week saw no less than six central bank meetings in the G10 space. At, yeah. Among five hikers, four currencies are down on the week. 
hiking doesn't work. It doesn't shore up well, the currency, Damian. That's the lesson we're learning, at least right now. One one currency that is up is the Brazilian real, though, and they and they did not hike, right? They've been way ahead of the curve, and so they decided to pause. And so, for some reason, I guess the markets are rewarding them for that. It's interesting. Yeah, well, you can always trust Damian to have the hot take on emerging markets and also on sports betting. He and I, you can catch later on tonight on Bloomberg Television, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and catch the lineup for all you need to know ahead of the games of the weekend. We're going to be speaking to Des Bryant, former wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. He made a big bet on the Cowboys last week, made about 37 grand on it. So we'll get his take on, on what he's betting uh, on in the week ahead. In terms of the market action, it doesn't seem investors are betting on equities or bonds or anything really other than the dollar this morning. Futures down 1.4%, the euro at 97.54 against the US dollar, and the 10-year yield at 376.65. Damian Sassauer and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Tom, John, and Lisa will be back on Monday. Have a great weekend. This is Bloomberg.